privilege and recognition of guests, the Honourable Premier. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, welcome back uh, to another day of debate to my colleagues and those tuned in at home and those who are gathered today in the public gallery. Welcome. I uh, hope you enjoy today's proceedings. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I was very uh, excited to see uh, a wonderful uh, feature story on Lucy Gallant, a 10-year-old Lucy from Sherbrooke, who is this year's Easter Seals ambassador, uh, getting ready to kick off her tour next week to go across PEI to visit all schools and to raise awareness and money uh, for the Easter Seals uh, uh, Foundation. Uh, Helen Chapman, the Executive Director of Easter Seals PEI, will be joining her, as will uh, many others, uh, her, her dad Christopher, her mother Melissa, her brother Jackson, everyone's pretty excited. Uh, and it's lovely to see uh, Lucy spread her message of kindness and inclusion for all. So I'm sure we'll all get an opportunity over the next uh, number of weeks to uh, see Lucy in action and hopefully we can all uh, uh, participate and, and give what we can. So the best of luck to Lucy. <clears throat> Uh, certain here a lot of chatter around about the upcoming East, East Coast Music Awards that are coming to Charlottetown and PEI uh, on the 1st of May. Uh, advertisements are running on uh, radio. I know I heard some this morning and there's lots of chatter about the wonderful talent that will be on display here. Uh, coinciding, of course, with the landing of lobsters around that time. So it should be a wonderful reason for people to be out and about in PEI and enjoying the bounty uh, of harvest from the water and, and the wonderful amount of talent that's on display, not just in Atlanta, Canada, but in PEI in general. So uh, the best of luck to all of those participating. Uh, I wanted to also recognize those nine Islanders who participated recently in the Boston Marathon and, and got across the finish line, uh, in particular to Darren Chason uh, from uh, Charlottetown or from Surrey, sorry, who uh, was the top Islander. Uh, also Amber McLeod from Stratford, Brock Vickerson from Warren Grove, uh, Christy Newson from Stratford, Kevin McIsaac from Stratford, Mary Beth Voss from Charlottetown, Maureen Peters from Stratford, uh, Beverly Walsh from Stratford, and of course the ageless wonder himself, Francis Fagan uh, from uh, Charlottetown, who is now into the hundreds of marathon completions I see. Uh, Francis regularly at the spa, um, Hard to keep up to him at the spa, but uh, he certainly is an inspiration to many. And if you run through uh, or take a trip through the Victoria Park and any morning, you'll see Francis with a group of runners out there uh, putting in the mile. So congratulations to Francis. He continues to be uh, a great uh, uh, beacon of, of hope for what can be accomplished if you put the hard work in. And I uh, also wanted to just finally say that uh, it is kind of a sad day as Canada's team, the uh, Montreal Canadiens, will not be competing in this year's Stanley Cup playoffs, Mr. Speaker. Missed just by a whisker, very, very close this year. And uh, I suspect that uh, uh, it'll be one of the few uh, years where we won't be in the playoffs and competing for the Stanley Cup. Uh, I, I will go out on a limb and say I think the Dallas Stars will be the Cup champions this year. Um, it won't be a Boston Marathon with the Leafs playing Boston in the playoffs this year, but that's a difficult matchup for a Montreal Canadiens fan. I'll probably be praying for the power to go out in that one. Uh, but overall, uh, just it's an exciting time of year. I, I, I love, of course, sports. I love playoff hockey. And even though the, the Canada's team, the beloved Canadians, won't be there, we'll, we'll try to tune in the best we can and find some enjoyment uh, along the way. But I know there's some... Leaf fans and Bruins fans in here, and I love to see their hopes as high as they are because the only solace I can get in the playoff run now is to drag them down with me. So, uh, but all the best of, to, for the proceedings today, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Speaker, and uh, it's a pleasure to rise and welcome all those who are watching online, in particular those watching from the seniors' home uh, in Tignish who. Uh, watch daily to the proceedings and all those in the gallery, thank you for coming in today. Uh, noticed uh, today some of the crab fishers are coming in with their traps. Uh, they uh, hit their quota. Unfortunately, they didn't get you know, a very good uh, price for their, uh, but their crab, but that didn't stop them from going out and, and fishing and doing whatever they can. So uh, good luck to uh, the other ones that are out. and. Uh, um, Hopefully they have a safe landing also too. So with that, Mr. S Mr. Speaker, I'll uh, just wish everyone uh, look forward to a good debate and wish them a good day. Thank you. I'm a leader of the third party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, <clears throat> the, the premier reminded me uh, after Lucy Gallant was in the in the gallery there the other day. Uh, 
I realized when I went to visit my parents, there's this, my parents always have these little special gifts that have been made for them. Like there's a, a soap holder and there's all these beautiful little crafts and drawings around my parents' house. And every time I go, they say that's from our adopted grandchild, Lucy. But I didn't make the connection. And so Lucy is, spends a lot of time at my parents' house, her and her brother. And so I thought that was, that was pretty special. So I'd just like to wish her the best of luck and say hello to, to my colleagues and everybody tuning in from around the island in Charlottetown, Victoria Park, and everyone joining us in the gallery today, welcome. Um, I had the opportunity to attend two AGMs last night. I didn't time it very well because I would have really liked to have seen Melissa Peter Paul speak at the, um, the PEI Muse Museum and, and Heritage Annual General Meeting, but I, my timing didn't work out. I was at uh, between the Credit Union AGM and the, the PEI Museum and Heritage AGM. And it was really interesting at the, the credit union uh, AGM, they were talking about a new financial program that they have. And I know there's been a lot of talk in here about financial literacy. And I thought if we could marry school, the school system and, and this program, it's called Each One Teach One. And their goal is to get into the school system, which is, so the reason discussion last night of putting it perhaps in the CEO class where they're already learning about budgeting, they do all kinds of, sort of things. And so they look at banking and budgeting and credit cards and debt and identity theft and fraud prevention, like really, really good topics. And um, they're really uh, eager to, to spread these literacies to islanders, and I myself would love to sit through the whole thing. Um, and they had great success working with the adventure group uh, who are, uh, they are working with youth, they work a lot with youth at risk. And, and one youth came up to the presenter last night and was just saying how much it's changed her life. And she wishes everyone had this because she thought people might be able to live a little bit more comfortably if they, if they kind of worked with their money properly. Um, also last night at the Credit Union AGM, the Volunteer of the Year was awarded to Jerry McKenzie. He had a very long list of volunteer gigs, so I'd just like to congratulate Jerry. Um, and the PEI Museum and Heritage AGM, it, it was really exciting. They had one of their most successful years ever last year. And some, they plan on anything, they said, if anything you've attended last year at any of their, uh, at their heritage sites to attend again, because they're always doing new and fresh things. So that was, they have um, Island Digital Voices, of course, which we've talked about before. They also have a magazine, the Island Magazine, and a podcast called The Hidden Island, which I didn't know about. So I look forward to listening to that. Uh, this evening, Spring Fling 24 is happening in support of the PEI Brain Injury Association. It's being held at the Black Jack Blanchard Family Center on Pond Street here in Charlottetown. The doors open at 6.30 and the tickets are available at the door for $15. There's live music and dancing and food and munchies and there's a cash bar. All the proceeds, of course, going to the Brain Injury Association. So it's a great opportunity to show support uh, for the association and raise awareness on brain injuries. And finally, Mr. Speaker, I just had the absolute pleasure of reading a book to Charlene Zakem's class. She is a grade three class at uh, West Royalty School, and it was actually part of uh, Canadian Agriculture Week, and we weren't able to, to, to uh, arrange a time during then, so I finally got in to read the book. It was a story of uh, a dog, a dog's perspective living next to a dairy farm. It was a really fun book. It sparked lots of fun conversations, and just was really nice to be in that school energy. So I hope that that positive school energy transfers into this room today, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. The member for Surya Myra. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Speaker, and good afternoon to uh, anyone tuning in in District 1, Surya Elmira, and welcome to our guests here in the gallery today. Uh, further to the Honourable Premier's uh, recognition of our island runners, uh, Mr. Speaker, I would like to congratulate the District 1 athletes that recently ran the 2024 Boston Marathon. Darren Jason of Bear River completed the 42.2 kilometre course in 3 hours and 24 minutes, making him the fastest PEI runner to take part in the marathon. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that's impressive given that I'm told that he was battling a bit of a flu bug through the event. Kevin McIsaac, formerly of Bear River, ran it in 3 hours and 34 minutes. And Mary Beth Voss, uh, who most would recognize as Mary Beth McCauley from Chepstow, uh, posted a time of 3 hours and 41 minutes. And Mr. Speaker, anyone who qualifies and runs the Boston Marathon is already a world-class runner, but these times are quite impressive. I'm very proud to rise today and acknowledge these three individuals and their accomplishments. You make District 1 very proud. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The uh, Minister of Economic Development, Innovation and Trade. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and good afternoon. Welcome to all those who are joining us in the gallery, uh, all those tuning in, especially from District 24, Evangeline Miskush. 
Uh, today, I'd like to rise to also uh, say a great thank you to uh, all our volunteers. It is Volunteer Appreciation Week. There is one organization that I've worked a long time with that I'd like to recognize today is the Evangeline Recreation Commission. They work uh, alongside uh, all our partners in the Evangeline area. Uh, but there is one particular individual that works in that, uh, on that board. It's Louis Richard. We know as uh, Canadian Tire Louis. Uh, he's been on that board for, I think, over 30 years. And him and his wife are very active volunteers in our, uh, in our community. So I'd like to publicly thank them for the work that they do to make sure that the kids stay active in our communities, but that uh, they keep working on the Evangeline uh, Recreation Commission. So thank you to Louis and to his wife, Diane, who uh, who is beside him all the, every step of the way. While I'm on my feet, I'd also like to wish a very happy birthday to my son, who's celebrating his 22nd uh, birthday uh, yesterday. I didn't forget, but he was in Mexico. And regardless if he was in Mexico or here, I know he's not paying attention to the proceedings. <laughs> but I want to wish Andre a very happy uh, 22nd birthday. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. The uh, Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I want to rise today, too, to acknowledge Volunteer Appreciation Week, and I specifically want to uh, mention uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters. Um, I was a big brother for, gosh, 10 years or so, um, back, uh, back starting in 1989. So um, what got me into uh, the Big Brother program was simply an article, I, I believe, in the Chamber newsletter about the wait time. So I seen a post today that said, wait list Wednesday alert. Um, currently, uh, Big Brothers of PEI has 40 littles uh, on the wait, uh, wait list, so I'd encourage uh, people to consider this program. Uh, I was ma ma matched with my little Nathan for almost eight years. Uh, he's now probably 40 years old. I wished him happy birthday on, on social a few weeks ago, and his answer was, thanks, Big Bro. So, Big Brothers, uh, please support that organization. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good afternoon to all my colleagues, uh, our gallery guests, and those tuning in from District 5, Mermaid Stratford. Mr. Speaker, I just wanted to recognize that last night I was able to attend Skills Canada PEI Awards Night of all of our uh, skilled worker uh, students and those training. Uh, the competition was uh, amazing, with 36 of our uh, competitors reaching gold medals, and we'll be attending nationals in Quebec in May, so I wish them the best of luck. The talent was uh, amazing in the room. Also, yesterday, Skills PEI had their uh, one of two job fairs uh, with over 900 um, uh, interested job seekers attending. It was a very successful afternoon where future employees were interacting with uh, potential employers um, for, for great opportunity. So I wish them a, a great job on that. Thank you. For Charlottetown Winslow. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, my wife uh, does not watch the legislature. Of course, she's busy teaching, but her father, uh, Gabe Keogh, does up in uh, Time Valley, Sherbrooke's uh, district. And uh, he had made it known to my wife that I had yet to congratulate my daughter's team on winning their provincial hockey championships. I did say I don't want to congratulate them when there's still something going on, so I'm not going to say congratulations to the U13 Storm girls, but I'm going to wish them the best of luck as they uh, go to the Atlantics tomorrow in Dieppe. So best of luck to the U13 AAA Storm Girls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You member for Rustico Emerald. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's really a pleasure to rise today and welcome everyone here to the House, everyone watching from District 18 Rustico Emerald, and of course, everybody to the gallery. And uh, it's great to see you all here today. Um, so I wanted to recognize that uh, Dara Clayton, uh, she's a fourth year environmental studies student from the island studying at UPEI. And uh, next to her is Olivia Leiden, who's uh, originally from Maine, but has been studying at UPEI, very passionate about environment and water. And Jane Farkason, heading now from Rustico in the great District 18, um, also a very passionate about climate change and uh, addressing community resiliency. Kelly Farrar, who's uh, I, I guess works with the Division of Forestry, Fish and Wildlife, Wildlife, but also very passionate about water and a longtime advocate and taking lots of actions as well. And then from the town of Stratford, the environmental coordinator, Kadaf Ajez, and it's great to see her here today as well. She's doing a mat leave fill-in, but something tells me she's going to be around a lot longer based on her passion as well. And finally, uh, it's great to see John McLean here, who I've known for a number of years, and he's been a great advocate for things like workers' comp, and the struggle is real, but he's the one to fight it. Cheers. 
member for Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'd like to welcome all those in the gallery and those watching from District 11. But I'd especially like to recognize a student from Stone Park Junior High. Um, Greta Edget Gallant was uh, a winner in the recent science fair that was held in Charlottetown. And she won the award for the UPEI Facility of Sustainable Design Engineering Progress Award. This award is to encourage and promote girls to pursue research in engineering and sustainability. So congratulations, Greta, on a job well done. And I'd also like to recognize Volunteer Appreciation Week and give a shout out to all those who help at the breakfast programs. Um, I believe that breakfast is the best part, best meal of the day, and it starts all of our students off on the right foot. So thank you to all those who uh, help support our breakfast programs. Thank you. Questions by members, starting with responses. Oh, yeah, I guess we better do that too, eh? I apologize, members. Uh, we'll do statements by members, and we'll start with the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Try to jump over. We know the responsibility of governing is something that this government struggles with. While they indulge in perks like trips to NHL Winter Classics, first-class flights to Denmark, and the influence that goes with governing, yet they do not seem to be up to the job of governing. Instead of addressing the core issues within our health care system, they are madly promoting privatization, demonstrated by initiatives like Maple Cash for Access, millions of dollars to private for profit nursing homes, and fee for service MRIs. Nowhere can I think of a more acute case of the privatization of core management or government services than our health care system. Rather than leading efforts to strengthen our public health care system, the Premier and the Minister of Health are pushing for increased privatization, uh, disregarding the concerns of frontline workers, and it's time that they prioritize listening to health care professionals and addressing the root causes of our system's shortcomings. These privatization measures not only compound um, inequality in access to care, but also dem uh, demoralize public service workers. To truly rebuild our public health care system, the government must show genuine commitment and cease prioritizing corporate interests over public health. Unfortunately, it seems they lack the dedication necessary for this task, opting instead for shortcuts that undermine the integrity of a healthcare system. In reality, this Premier and his government appear indifferent to the needs of Islanders and the importance of public health care. Their eagerness to hand over parts of our health care system for profit corpora uh, corporations reflect a pattern of negligence and avoidance of responsibility. They resort to empty rhetoric, inaction, and scapegoating when confronted with their failures. If there is one thing they are consistent at, it is this, do nothing and blame others. Thank you. Member for Rustico Emerald. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, imagine a workshop that teaches grade five students about water conservation where our water comes from and how watersheds work, complete with hands-on simulations of teeth brushing, toilet flushing, and even working models of farmland and buffer zones where students can pour in the water and watch the runoff. Well, you don't have to imagine because the Water's Cool Water School has existed for over 12 years here on PEI. The brainchild of Billy Ramsey and Kelly Farrar, the Water School started in the town of Stratford and has expanded to Cornwall and Charlottetown, and it's carried on by environmental coordinators in the towns, like Kadoff Aegis here today. And to date, more than 3,000 students have attended. In fact, our very own Minister of Finance is a graduate of the Water School. Recently, Jane Farkasen saw the potential of rolling out the Water School to more Islanders. Jane also co-founded the NASCAR team of citizen volunteers passionate about addressing climate change. She seized the opportunity, and NASCAR partnered with the UPEI Environmental Studies Program and three fourth-year students on a project to strategize how to expand the Water School to all grade five students across PEI. On Monday, I had the privilege of attending the students' final presentation, and I want to recognize Professor Dr. Carolyn Beach-Brown and her students, Olivia Lydon, Dara Clayton, and Vijeta Tatur, Chatter, I should say, who's studying here all the way from Dubai. Uh, their work updating water school content, introducing a cost-effective and sustainable method for its models, creating surveys for evaluation, and recommending stakeholders for future collaboration has laid the groundwork for expansion. And Mr. Speaker, I believe now is the time for our provincial government to come to the table and help fund an implementation project to expand the water school across PEI and maybe beyond. Thanks again to Jane, Carolyn, Olivia, Dara, and Vegeta, and especially Billy and Kelly for your visionary work 
on the water school. The member for Charlottetown Winslow. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise today to recognize Junior Achievement, JA Day. Junior Achievement, or JA Day as it's colloquially known, uh, will take place on Friday, April 19th at McDonald's restaurants here across the province. For every purchase made, McDonald's will donate a portion of their sales to help support Junior Achievement programs in our island schools. Junior Achievement PEI helps island youth build transfer transferable skills. Junior Achievement provides free educational programs in the areas of financial literacy, work readiness and entrepreneurship to over 5,000 island students from grades 3 to 12 on an annual basis. JA Prince Edward Island works in collaboration with educators, with volunteers and organizations across the island to help deliver hands-on, immersive and digital learning experiences island-wide. Mm -hmm. Their mission, Mr. Speaker, is to inspire and prepare students to succeed in a global economy. So this Friday, April 19th, please come out and support Junior Achievement Day at all McDonald's restaurants on PEI. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, members. Questions by members, starting with responses to questions taken as notice. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question for the Minister of Health. We all know that our island has an aging population. And according to the province's own estimates, there were 35,000 people over the age of 65 in 2022. And again, according to the province, that number will rise by 9,000 over the next eight years. In other words, there will be a huge new pressure on our current systems of long-term care. If we expect to provide appropriate service to an aging population, and part of the answer should be public government-owned facilities. My question to the Minister of Health. Are there plans right now to significantly add to the number of public long-term care beds in our province? There you go. Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, thank you for the question. Yes, we understand. Uh, they call it the gray tsunami uh, that is, is kind of uh, coming in Canada. We know we have an aging population. We have made additional investments in home care. Um, again, we're up to 2,500 visits a month. So again, that's a great uh, a program that allows our seniors to be cared for in, in a great way. Uh, we'll continue to look at our public facilities. Again, it's a capital uh, budget uh, exercise that we must go through in order to expand those facilities, but we will continue to do so. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. There is a very clear pattern with this government. Instead of using government to provide many services, there appears to be a willingness to hand these responsibilities over to others. Now, I've heard many times a suspicion that is part of uh, an agenda to privatize uh, public services. And in part, I, I do believe that is true. But I think there's a simpler explanation to this agenda. I believe this government wants to run away from its responsibility and avoid the kind of health scrutiny and, uh, that accompanies public delivery of services. A question for the Minister of Health. In the face of a rapidly aging population, why isn't the government aggressively building public long-term care facilities? Minister of Health or the Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I would again, I tried to do this yesterday, but I would again plead with the opposition to please stop making up an issue that isn't there. Uh, this is totally and utterly ridiculous from every aspect. And when I brought this up to the Honourable he Opposition House Leader yesterday, he smiled as if he knew how ridiculous it was, but he's just playing out the string because we're in here. Like, let's get real here. We have a growing population, we have an aging population, and we need all hands on deck to deliver it. Islanders want to help out. Islanders need that help. I want them to help. We've hired every nurse we could possibly hire. We've gone around the world to hire 107 nurses for our public system. Them. I've hired every doctor we could hire. We've hired 23 alone this year. We're partnering with the U University of Prince Edward Island for a medical school to train 20 doctors a year, every year here, and they've fought against it every step of the way. So I hope all of the union and government officials out there understand where this is coming from, who it's coming from, and what utter nonsense and waste of time it is in here. All hands are on deck and we need to provide the best. Stop this Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I guess that just confirms my, uh, the preface I used, which I believe this government wants to way, run away from responsibility and avoid the kind of health scrutiny that accompanies public delivery of services. And the Premier didn't even ask my, answer my question in his little spin. So, Madam Speaker, I believe in the great ability of government to truly respond to fundamental needs of the public. 
While I certainly respect the role of the private sector, I think it's important to remember it's a single motive, and that motive is profit. When it comes to long-term care, why is this government so intent on inflating the profit margins of the private sector? The Honourable Premier. We are working with everybody within the health care system to provide health care. I don't know if the Honourable Member knocked on doors during the election, but every door that I knocked on, from Tignish to Surrey and every door in between, talked about the need for health care delivery to improve, and Islanders expect us to lean in, to work with everyone within that system to make sure we're doing the best job that we can. They don't care who wears the coat. They want service. And I can't believe that we continue to see this attack on islanders. These are islanders. He just referenced the, uh, uh, in Tignish, there are individuals who provide care up there. There are wonderful, caring islanders who care for islanders in need. We need them all together. Can we stop pitting one against the other here? And for once in this legislature, this session, look at what's best for Prince Edward Island as a whole and stop this utter foolishness, yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And yes, I was at the doors. Healthcare, housing, and the cost of living. Top three issues for the last uh, two times at the door in the by-election also. And this government fails to address any one of those issues. So, Mr. Speaker, in 2021, the province released a report called the Internal Long-Term Care Review. Within that report, which was released less than three years ago, there is an alarming warning. And I will quote from that now. If PEI continues on its current path, a 35% increase in the total number of long-term care beds will be required by 2025, end quote. Now, that's a huge increase, Mr. Speaker. So my question for the Minister, since that report was released in 2021, how many long-term care beds have been added on to here in Prince Edward Island? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, we just added 54 beds last week in a record pace, and all I've heard from the other side is complaints. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. 54 beds that were announced after licensing. We have yet to see that. This again, this government loves to throw out big headlines, but cannot back it up. So according to that report, there were 1,244 long-term care beds in 2021. Now that's both private and public. And three years later, in February 2024, government gave a presentation to the Standing Committee on Health. At that time, government reported that there were 1,240 five long-term care beds on the island. And that represents a one bed increase in three years. Mm. One bed in three years. And I'll table the relevant documents today. So a simple question for the Minister of Health. You knew a massive shortage was taking place, and in three years you added only one bed. What on earth was the reason for all this delay? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, could we ask the Honourable Leader of the Opposition, quite honestly, to pick a lane here? Do we want to invest in health care beds, as he said, or do we not want to do it? Every time we lean in to do it, they say, well, you can't do this, you can't do that, you didn't do it fast enough. Can we pick a lane? Can we find out what you want? I know it's not possible to make any one of you over there happy, but can you pick a lane and pick the lane that Islanders are in, and that is, let's get the best health care that we can get. Whoever can work in and lean in on this to do the best job they can, that's what we should be doing. I'm working with all partners. Anyone who wants to deliver health care out there to Prince Edward Islanders, I'll pay for it and we'll get it done. Yeah. Yeah. He won't be paying for it. It's the taxpayers of PEI that will be paying for it. And there needs to be an accountability from this government to the taxpayers of Prince Edward Island. They need to know where their dollars are going. So, Mr. Speaker, I think this delay is quite obvious. This do-nothing government waited around until a crisis clearly emerged, and then they turned over all the responsibility to the private sector. And now it's relying on the, on the profit motive to solve their problems. I will go back to an earlier question, which... which which is also a request to this government. Why isn't the government taking an aggressive approach to build public, long-term care beds and deal with the shortages that you identified yourselves three years ago? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I didn't need to wait for a crisis. I inherited it in 2019 after 11 years of total utter chaos from his government, Mr. Speaker, which I would add, he left the PC party to join 
Mr. Speaker. So he rolled into the fire. He rolled into the fire and he grabbed a handful of grass and he spread it all across Prince Edward Island. I will take no lessons in this province from the health care delivery of Liberal Party of Prince Edward Island after 11 years of utter chaos, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'll say it here today. I left the PC party because there was a feeding frenzy from the trough in the back room. So going back to the internal report on long-term care, it's clear that there's an opportunity for this province to take a greater role in the public delivery of this essential service. So according to this report, only 28% of long-term care homes across Canada are held by profit-making businesses. Now in New Brunswick, only 12% are held by privately owned, profit-driven businesses. In Newfoundland, only 3% are profit-driven. On Prince Edward Island, 47%. So why aren't we pursuing a model which promotes public care instead of handing over so much of this much-needed service to the public sector? Honourable Premier. Well, to again stand here, Mr. Speaker, and tell you that I'm very, very proud of the hybrid model of health care delivery we have in this province. It's the realistic uh, position that we find ourselves in in a small jurisdiction. All I've heard is complaints from the other side for five years running now. We don't have enough people for this. We don't have enough people for that. And every time we lean in to do something, they say, oh my gosh, please don't fix it. I think they love the chaos. They created it for 11 years, but we've been working every day for five years to fix it, and every day it gets a little bit better in this province, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. That the Premier, I would love to say that the Premier's calendar reflects that he's been working every day. However, I can't say that. So last week, the province issued a news release to go along with its $25 million payout to the private sector. And it says, and I quote, the province will be issuing a tender requesting proposals from private homes to build hundreds of new beds over the years. End quote. Will you be providing grants and loans to the private sector to do this? Furthermore, you will, will you be handing out 2% loans to the private sector? All this to achieve those goals. So how much money does the minister expect, expect to hand over to private businesses to do all of this? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I know the opposition's leader is not a stickler for details, but the member, uh, the Minister of Health and Wellness outlined in great detail what our plan is. Our plan to build the beds that he talks that we haven't spent any time on. We've actually been spending hours and hours and hours in working with the private sector and the public sector to deliver what we need to deliver on. There will be a capital budget coming this fall where we will address the public side of this, and we're also going to be working with our private sector to deliver the beds that we need to do. I could get the Minister to read it again, give them the information, but they don't go to meetings, they don't listen to anybody, and they don't read any documents, so I don't know if it would do any good, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. That's hilarious coming from a Premier who wouldn't even go to a health meeting in the summer side and been asked to go to that. So according to the 2021 internal report, now this will be very, very expensive, Mr. Speaker, and I will quote from that report, the 35% in beds will have an approximate capital cost of over $134 million and an additional operating cost of more than $30 million, end quote. Now this is a huge investment and I'm sure that all private operators are very excited about this. But from someone who believes in the public role, in public services, I'm certainly not that enthusiastic. So before we go any further down the private track, will the minister table all of the agreements that were signed with private operators to support the $25 million he handed out last week. Mm. Yeah, uh, Mr. Speaker, I would also go back and list the documents, uh, of course, that the Honourable Member, uh, his government used to be part of, uh, the investments they made in Medivy for home care, which was just irritated the public sector uh, who thought they were taking jobs away from RCWs. I could talk about the investments they made in long-term care. The same people we're investing in, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member over there was part of a government who invested in the very same, and even the member from O'Leary Inverness in his brief stint as the Minister of Health would have signed documents to give money to those wonderful people who provide care in this province. Hypocrite? I don't know what else you can call it, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I shouldn't use that word. I shouldn't call him a hypocrite. I'm sorry, but uh, I don't know what other word to use, but I take it back, Mr. Oh, Speaker. I take it back. You're right. I am the Premier, and you're not. Great role model. And Member for Charlton and West Rosie. Okay. Point of order. Point of order on that comment. The uh, member or the leader of the opposition. Our honourable member. 
You can't call up a point of order until you release the opportunity until after question period. The is. I withdrew the comment, Mr. Speaker. I withdraw the comment. It's unparliamentary. I shouldn't have. Thank you, it. Honorable Premier. The Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So that's getting quite heated. But I'm going to quote from the former speaker. He said, "You can't move forward if you keep looking in the rearview mirror," and that's something that this government has a, a problem with. So you see, Mr. Speaker, this is really about a government that wants to avoid its responsibility. And that responsibility is to provide public service and to be accountable. You would rather hide behind others and in a few people get, let a few people get wealthy in the process. And I'm sure you will be more than happy with that. So will the minister please give the House some idea of the profits currently being made by the private businesses delivering services that have a public interest? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I hope that uh, perhaps when this legislature ever closes, I could take the Honourable Member and we could go out and visit Douglas McKenzie at, uh, at the John Gillis Lodge. We could go visit Paul Jenkins, who would be no stranger to you, Mr. Speaker. We could go visit up to South Shore Villa, where the Honourable Member from Borden King Cora would have did campaigning during the, 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 the election. And I bet he would not have one ounce of courage to stand up there, Mr. Speaker, and say what he's saying in here. I know them. I know where they come from. I know the people who work in here every day. I'm proud of the work they do. And as long as I'm standing here, Honourable Member, I will invest in the health care delivery of this province with any partner who wants to work to make it better for Prince Edward Islanders. But if you don't want investment, I think we know who to call. Here, here. very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I know he is proud. He's very proud to stand behind them. Of course he is. Stand behind them. Yeah. So, Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Minister of Public Safety provided Islanders and this House his assurance that immediate action would be taken place to ensure accurate GPS mapping for emergency responders. Here's a quote from the Hansard, from, from the Minister of uh, Agriculture, the Minister of Justice and Public Safety, Attorney General, and the Deputy Minister. Thank you for bringing this to my attention. We'll look at it right away." End quote. Given the sense of urgency of this matter, can the Minister tell the House what steps he took to address this public safety issue? The uh, Minister of Justice and Public Safety. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I, I do appreciate the member bringing that to my attention, but I wish he hadn't waited to uh, Tuesday of the ledge to do that. Uh, he, he knows he can reach out to me anytime if there's a public safety issue. Uh, we, we, we reached out to the 911 department yesterday and uh, they are uh, dealing with it as we speak. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question to the Premier. And um, I listen to my constituents and I have three uh, government owned long term. Uh, government home housing units in my area, Charlotte Court, Rankin Court, and Hunt Court. Um, continuously, they, they talk about the assessment formula. Um, every year it comes up in June, and it's archaic, it's, it's old, and it stresses people out. They don't like the formula, and they don't understand it. Mr. Premier, why are we still doing this? We've capped rents. Why are we looking to our, uh, our seniors who live in government-owned facilities to get a few extra dollars for them? Will you stand up today and get rid of this assessment formula? Honourable Premier. I, I would have to take the question under advisement uh, to uh, fully understand. I, I, I assume you mean that we would look at their uh, income and assess their rent based on that. Uh, I would have to get a little bit more intel on it, to be honest, but I will get back to the Honourable Member uh, as soon as I can. Refer with Erie Inverness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Islanders continue to brace for further increases in their electricity bills as we have the Point La Pro refurbishment, the bill for Fiona, and continuing inflationary pressures. We know the PEI electrification network is older, and it could be susceptible to distributing efficient power. In other words, the working power available compared to the reactive power available is different. There are shortages within the network where power is lost or wasted. Recently, BC Hydro set new standards for power quality and fines are issued when utilities do not meet certain standards of power efficiency. Question to the Minister of Environment and Energy. What are you doing to ensure that power distributing networks work efficiently so power is not lost in transmission so we don't need to import additional energy to meet our growing needs for electricity in the Minister province? Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So over the last couple of years, we've been working on modernizing our act. We had a, a whole public uh, part of it happened last year. We have a report, our final report, that should be released in and around June, and we're going to take immediate action to write legislation to, to match that in the, in the end. And 
a lot of those things are dealt with. Like, what's a modern act look like? What's how how does a modern utility work? And there's great examples all over the world of utilities that work different. And uh, if you want to see a great example of an island that works really well, a place like Hawaii would be one that I would favor probably. But I'm going to let the process play out, and the staff will come back with their recommendations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Willary Inverness. Thanks, Minister. And that is encouraging that you are looking in, into that particular issue. But more efficient power will improve electrical equipment lifespans and improve voltage, reduce transformer maintenance, and increase lifespans, while provides cost savings to the utility and filers. Question to the Minister. Will you work, uh, look into implementing incentives or penalties to encourage our power distributors to become more efficient in their power transmission in the meantime? The uh, Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. So, yeah, we'll, we'll go back and, and look at it. One of the things that I've talked about in the House here a lot of times is uh, we were looking at what a distributed energy model would look like. And we, by, by definition, we have one of the finest models of distributed energy with rooftop solar now, but we're looking at what it would look like at a substation level or a community level so that we can ensure a number of things. We can build resiliency for climate change. We can reduce power loss across the grid because the power is being produce close to where it's being used, which is the whole purpose of, of distributed energy. Plus there's an opportunity for community, um, for communities to own and operate like, like Summerside's doing, like Lennox Island is working towards and put the profits back into their own, their own community. So there's a number of reasons why we're doing it, but yeah, we're gonna tackle it. Thank you, Member. Member for O'Leary and Renes. Thanks, Minister. A few weeks ago, the Minister told CBC and the Legislature that he's considering taking over our two power utilities and making them uh, publicly owned companies. I'm sure this was news to both those particular companies, uh, City of Somerset as well as Maritime Electric. Is the province, if the province was to take over Maritime Electric or the Somerset Power Utility, as you said you're looking into, would you commence uh, into looking into the power distribution to be more efficient? The Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Uh, th thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. So, yeah, if we, if we r were to run it, we would want to run it with the most highest level of efficiency possible. And we are working our way through that, that process. We're hoping to have something to report back in the not-too-distant future on where we are with our, our process. And, and I do want to add, I mean, this is something that you should get behind. Uh, everyone in here should get behind what we're, what we're talking about and what we're looking at doing here because I, I can't think of a single thing that I've participated in as a minister yet that I've received so much positive feedback about than, than looking at taking the utility in to operate it. I mean, I'm, I'm hearing from mayors that are in favour. I'm, I'm hearing at the, in, in the grocery store I'm in favour. Like, if, if, if there's ever there, a time to be on the right side of an issue, which I know Liberals can never be, but this is the time, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Member for Borden Kinkora. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I recently spoke with several pharmacists who are deeply concerned by this government's actions which are destabilizing our community pharmacies. Government without any consultation with community pharmacies is adding pharmacists into their patient medical homes. As with all highly trained workers, we only have a limited number of pharmacists, so when the government poaches them from the community pharmacies, those pharmacies are left with reduced staff and have no option but to reduce hours, resulting in reduced access to care for islanders. This unfortunately may impact the rural pharmacies and rural islanders uh, the most. Question to the Minister of Health. What benefit to pharmacists, Minister, add to medical homes that could not be achieved by partnering with the pharmacies already in place and that are already providing exceptional services across every community in Prince Edward Island? Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question. Obviously, I'm, I'm pretty intimate with uh, the pharmacy profession, for lack of a better term. Um, it should be noted uh, that recently we passed 100,000 assessments in our Pharmacy Plus program. So again, back to... There could be a discussion. We're privatizing that too as well. But again, they're providing health care services where people need it, when they need it. So again, that Pharmacy Plus program is hugely successful and we'll continue to work with our pharmacy associations to deploy them as best we can. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Gordon Kinkora. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And it's the Pharmacy Plus program that I'd have concerns about being maintained because we're losing those pharmacists into the patient medical homes. So we're seeing already, uh, Mr. Speaker, hours in the community pharmacists being reduced because of the duplication of roles. 
Increasing access should be the goal of any medical home. However, if you want to access a pharmacist in a medical home, you'll need to be a patient of the medical home. You'll need to make an appointment. You'll still need to walk over to the community pharmacy next door to fill your prescription. So you're actually taking a frontline health care provider away from Islanders and unnecessarily uh, increasing patient traffic at the already busy patient medical homes. Question to the same minister. Does this actually sound like improved access to care to you? Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you. You should ask your, uh, the, a person that's a couple seats over you whether you want to take people from the private sector and put them in the public sector now. So again, uh, we get a lot of uh, conflicting messages uh, here. It's important to note, I believe the number's around six or seven community pharmacists that we have hired into the public system. There's about 240 or something, uh, or 260, I think, uh, overall in Prince Edward Island. So it represents two or three percent of our workforce. But we do acknowledge that we need to balance, like any workforce in health, we always have to balance balance the, the pros and cons of moving people around, health care or home care versus long-term care is another issue where we try to balance our workforce and do the best we can. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Borden Kinkora. So, so Mr. Speaker, the medical homes, if they're going to be successful, must increase patient flow. And making patients who want to see a pharmacist come through a medical home just bogs up the system and frankly doesn't make any sense at all. If the patient needs a pharmacist, they can simply go to their community pharmacy anytime, no charge, evenings and weekends. And we have medical homes in Kenlock, Sherwood, Queen Street, Polyclinic, Central Queen, South Shore, already have a community pharmacy in the same building. Question to the Minister, will you commit to working with and instead of against community pharmacies across the island to ensure patient access is increased and not decreased? Mr. Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and again, and not to, not to make light of the situation, I certainly will try to balance uh, the pharmacy uh, um, a balance for both my marriage and both my job. Uh, again, we understand, again, that it's important to, uh, to balance both uh, ways. We have about 49 pharmacies in, in the province that provide incredible care. Um, so again, we need to balance the workforce. So I, agree, I do agree with the member, and uh, I have met with the association. We'll continue to meet uh, with them on balancing workforce uh, needs that we have in that, in that sector. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Forests provide so many benefits to our province. They capture carbon, they provide habitat, holding soil, cleaning air, regulating hydrological cycles, enhancing the beauty of Prince Edward Island, and on and on and on. They also provide significant economic benefits, creating jobs and producing valuable products. Government itself reports that the total economic value of forest activities on Prince Edward Island to be about $4 million. The Forestry Commission estimates that the value of biomass heating alone is about $4 million. So clearly there's a vast underestimate of the economic value of the forests to this province. A question to the Minister of Environment. What efforts is your department making to provide islanders, and in particular private woodlot owners, with a more accurate measure of the true economic value of our forests? Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, we, as a government, have been working with, uh, with the industry, for example, with the stamp lumber thing, so that, so that we could use, uh, so, so that we gave them the ability to stamp lumber on the island and use some of their lumber a as lumber. Uh, we've worked to add value to the forest through a carbon credit system that's not stood up, stood up yet, which, which, is, which, which has the intention of leaving wood standing, but giving it value standing, which it currently doesn't have. I mean, the only value a forest has monetarily is when it's knocked down and from the, an environmental standpoint and a climate action standpoint we'd rather it stood uh, because it can um, sequester carbon uh, it, uh, all the, the great things that you've already mentioned so um, it's a great question I mean I look forward to the second question so, to get into the real meat of what you're asking but we're doing all we can for sure thank you Mr. Speaker. Member for New Haven, Rocky Point. Especially for the Minister. Number two. One of the uh, issues that was raised recently by a forestry commission is the unsustainable use of biomass for our heat generators. And the Auditor General's report from last year found that sustainability audits of sites that were harvested for biomass heating of government buildings were not completed, despite a requirement in the agreement signed with the third party contracts who, contractors who were doing the harvesting to the same Minister. What is your department going to do to ensure that our precious forests, as you've just described, standing forests, when we do have to harvest them, that they're harvested in a sustainable manner? Mr. <coughs> Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I think this, this, 
first of all, it'll be mandatory in order, order to get carbon credits. So there has to be a sustainability model and a forestry management plan to get a carbon credit out of it. So hopefully, as people see the value of standing woodland as, as carbon credits, they'll have to have a forestry management plan in order to, to attain it. And they'll obviously have to leave it standing or, or harvest in a sustainable manner. So we'll continue to work towards that goal. And uh, I mean, obviously, at the end of the day, that we would legislate if we had to, but at this point, I don't think that's going to be necessary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for New Haven, Rocky Point. Uh, thanks, Mr. Speaker. The, the most recent forestry policy laid out plans for major shifts in emphasis from softwoods to hardwoods, to planting hardwoods in favor of softwoods. The problem is we've never, ever been close to favoring hardwoods in this province. Ten years ago, we reached an all-time high watermark when just over 9% of the seedlings were, that we produced were hardwoods. Over 90% were still softwoods. Today, we're at half of that, about 4 4 5%. To the same minister, why is the department not pursuing our forest plan that favors hardwood seedlings and, in so doing, creating more resilient forests, hardwood forests here on Prince Edward Island that are better able to weather the more ferocious and frequent storms that we're bound to have in the future? Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So going forward, we, we will. I think that the, the Forestry Commission report was important to us. I mean, the, some of the things are, are tough, but I think it was, you know, I think it was extremely fair. We have to do better in, in a number of areas. And, and I've said right from the start, we, we accept all the recommendations in the report and we'll make the necessary changes. Uh, and I think I said during bud, budget estimates, it's really hard to ramp it up from 30,000 to 500,000. It's, re it's really hard just to take your seedling production and change it like that overnight. But we are going to work towards uh, making that, that change. And uh, I mean, obviously, we can get deeper into the weeds on that. But we, we accept the report. And we'll, we will do what we need to do to change. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Rustico Emerald. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we used to talk a lot about water here in this Legislative Assembly. I remember six or eight years ago, it was a topic of almost every question period. I know the member from New Haven Rocky Point uh, killed a water bottling plant before it ever got started. I mean, I asked tons of questions uh, on legislation that was coming forward, and I, and I really advocated for the watershed group. So we haven't talked enough about it lately, Mr. Speaker. Uh, water is more important than ever on our island as the population grows. Uh, in particular, I think this government has done some good work and, and the water registry has allowed us to do some, uh, get some great visibility into our water. A question for the Minister of, uh, of Environment. Um, how is the PEI water registry being used to monitor and protect our island water? The uh, Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, I mean, for the first time, I think we have complete open access to what's going on. I think that was one of the important things that uh, it might have been you yourself started when you were in the department. And I will say a number of hands have touched this. The Minister of Education was involved in this file too heavily. Uh, Robert Mitchell headed across the island. I know I went to a number of sessions that when, when the act itself was before it was even drawn up to get the public co consultation. So there's been an enormous amount of public consultation in this, none of which uh, I did. It was all done, done before me. But uh, I think that, you know, probably the biggest thing is, is now you can see all the time and there's nothing hidden. It's there 100% of the time. Everybody can see what's going on and, and it's by watershed by watershed so we can closely monitor it. And, and so the public can keep an eye and make sure that we're doing what we said we would do. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The yeah, member for Rustico Emerald. Well, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And one of the one of the things that um, it doesn't get raised as as much to me now, but uh, definitely does, is is uh, high capacity wells, or the formerly known as deep water wells. And that was a big issue, and something Islanders were really worried about in at least two elections. And um, I really feel like this water registry is giving us the data we need to make sure that high capacity wells can exist and be in, in a, a form that's not going to negatively impact our water. Um, question for the minister. Uh, can, you, can you talk about um, uh, any changes to the number of high capacity wells or what you're doing to make sure high capacity wells won't negatively impact our water supply? The Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So the Act pretty well lays out and the regulations lays out how the water can be used when a high capacity well is there and the things that, uh, that an entity needs to do prior to being able to, to get one, of you know, dealing with soil health, health and a number of other things that go along with it. Um, we haven't seen a major 
ask for them. I mean, we've been very fortunate. We haven't had a dry summer since the, the regulations changed to allow um, the high capacity wells. But what I will say is we are actively working on getting them in the Dunk River to take away the surface extraction, which, uh, which arguably is a much better, um, I'm not a hydrologist, but I am told it's a much better way to, to draw water and it'll have a much lower impact on the Dunk River. But uh, we've said from the start, if we need to stop somebody from, from withdrawing water because it's having a negative impact, then obviously we would. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Rushtoo Emerald. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And indeed, I, I have farmers who are constituents that farm in that Dunk River area, and uh, high capacity wells are really going to make things more efficient for them as well as protect our water supply. So that's great to hear. But uh, you mentioned the Water Act. It was a model of public consultation at the time, and uh, we asked lots of questions. Uh, one of the things, uh, one of the reasons we voted for it was for future sections that were going to come into play. For example, water management areas, because you have to look at things, for example, on a watershed by watershed basis in order to manage your waters properly. Those areas of the Water Act weren't filled in yet. So a question to the Minister, um, what progress have you made on the Water Act and specifically filling in the blanks for the watershed management area portion? Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. So we do have the data. I mean, we do, though they're all still monitored because They've been monitored all, all along. So we obviously have more, more work to do. We uh, acknowledge that. And, and as we have to bring in some of these new components, a lot of the, you know, the, the way the business of the world is kind of somewhat changing too. And we, have to, we had to put in regulations, for example, on, um, on geothermal wells because there's a lot more people moving to geothermal wells for um, climate change reasons and a number of other reasons. Um, and that is also part of of the act that had to be regulated. So it's going to be a moving target, I think, for forever. And, uh, you know, I'll get you a better update than that on on how we're triggering the rest of the components. But I know we're, we're working actively on it all the time. And uh, I want to commend our staff for the great work they've done. They've really taken what was a huge issue five years ago and, and made it uh, an almost non-existent issue for the department today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Rustico Emerald. Well, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and that's why I'm asking these questions because I, I think it's critical that water management areas are brought in so our water can be managed properly. And uh, our municipalities, uh, as, as we've heard through initiatives like the Water School, have have stepped up to the plate and are doing a, a lot of the work. I mean, they've created their own water conservation programs. They have water metering and a vested interest in, in water conservation, of course. Um, and that was the driving force behind the water school. So a question to the minister. Um, that's great for municipalities. But what are you doing to promote water conservation outside of towns and cities in unincorporated areas? The uh, Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. So uh, I'm... Probably not a lot. You probably know that, and and uh, I've talked about it in the legislature here before that, you know, we're trying to to move to war a more holistic pro approach to water. I remember the leader of the opposition brought a bill forward to make water tests free, and I talked about it at that point too, where we want to put everything under an entity that's external to government. So we we want to make it like an arm's length or a crown corporation that would that would own basically. The, all the abilities for water inside it. So anybody that was going to apply for any type of a well or any type of service would, would move there and do that right across the aisle. And obviously there's a number of issues with that, not the least of which is the number of municipalities, as you talked about, who already have all their system and have a lot of money invested into their architecture and how would we deal with that. So it's a major, major play, but I think the Water Act makes that the obvious next move for us to make sure that water is dealt with the same right across the board, whether you are on a water system or you're like me, you have a well enough. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Rustico Emerald. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So uh, the, the whole point between water management areas is it gives the minister the power to create special regulations for those areas. And we often think of them as being, you know, watersheds would be the water management areas. But it was brought to my attention that, you know, perhaps the coast of of the island could be considered a water management area, especially as we see sea uh, water levels rise because of, of climate change. And, and uh, you know, frankly, I have constituents who are worried about uh, the impacts of, of salt water through salt water intrusion on the drinking water in these coastal areas. So have you, have you considered treating the coast of PEI as a water management area to help manage the salt water intrusion through climate change? 
the Ministry of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No, I, I haven't, but I think it's a really good point. I mean, we're, as you know, we're going through the uh, a process now on shoreline protection, which basically is creating literal cells, and I think there's 17 of them across the island, that would be managed areas of shoreline that would be managed by hopefully the municipality or, or something in that capacity. But it would fall right in line with that if we're already doing that type of work too to, to deal with, because I, I think it's going to be a big issue down the road with the saltwater intrusion that that we haven't seen yet from from climate change as the as the shoreline erodes and and it gets closer to where the wells are i think you're going to see a lot more people having to deal with saltwater intrusion and quite frankly it's a not as you know an easy problem to fix thank you mr speaker the member for rustico emerald well thank you mr speaker so uh today we heard in my member's statement about the water's cool water school i mean it, it's just a great initiative and it has uh, really a fantastic potential for, for water education and action, uh, really spawning action on the conversation, uh, 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 conservation of water, pardon me, and of course uh, uh, watersheds and the work that's done in watersheds. So a, a question uh, to the Minister of, of Environment. Will you commit to supporting the rollout of the water school across PEI? The uh, Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, I think it's a great idea, and I was really excited. You showed me the, the video and stuff. The other day. I was really excited about the whole concept. I don't know how, like I, I'm trying to think of how that would work roll, roll in and out. It might be better suited for the Minister of Education. Perhaps we can have a, a chat up offline and, and talk about it. Yeah, but I'd be 100% in support of it because I think it, it outlines a number of things that are, are, are concepts that we deal with every single day with water, that it, it's kind of like climate change. If we can catch them at those primary ages, it's a great time to have a lifetime worth of uh, environmentalists help protecting water for us. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Charlton and West Royalty, final question. Question to the Minister of Health. In my area, there's Beach Grove, home to over 120 residents, amazing staff, and people that work there constantly. M Minister, what do I say to the staff at Beach Grove Home who watch you give a private grant to, to private nursing homes when they've been sitting on Issues around doorways, just getting access to courtyards. I've brought this up numerous times, Minister, and still nothing is happening. 11 doors now, uh, almost a million dollars investment, but yet you so cavalierly give it to private nursing homes. When are you going to fix the doors at Beach Grove Home? Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And I, I know we're supposed to answer questions, or answer questions here, but I would pose the question to the Honourable Member. If he's sitting across the table from... Uh, 10 nursing home operators and they offered to uh, uh, supply us with 50 beds, would he say no? I doubt he would. So again, but back to the question on, on Beach Grove Home, we've shared the uh, RFP and the letter process that those improvements are going to be made. Uh, we've made those commitments. Uh, we've emailed you the, uh, the documentation. So again, I agree, can't go fast enough, but again, building capacity and getting a contractor on site, but it's, the work is, is gonna, gonna happen at Beach Grove Home. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. End of question period. Statements by Ministers. The Minister of uh, Economic Development, Innovation and Trade. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to rise today to announce that applications for the Spring 2024 Ignition Fund are open. As you may know, this program supports island entrepreneurs looking for startup capital for innovative business ventures or to develop and launch groundbreaking products. This is a great program administered through Innovation PI, which accepts application in both the spring and the fall. Successful participants are granted up to $25,000 in funding to assist their work. I know this is a meaningful amount that can help kickstart business ideas and potential products that will positively impact our economic landscape. Many Islanders have an entrepreneurial mindset, and I am proud to continue to support them through this grant. The deadline for applications is May 13 at 1 p.m. And I encourage all entrepreneurs with new innovative ideas to apply. If you have any questions at all, please reach out to our Innovation PI Business Development Officers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Sheraldine West Royalty. Thanks a lot. It's, a, it's more about, about getting the word out there that this fund is out there. And uh, we want all businesses to apply because... It was, a, it was a very good program developed on this side of the, well, this side of the house way back, and I'd like to see the minister uh, announcing it. So um, 
uh, entrepreneurs are the, really the spirit of, of what's, what's going to be new in the future and what they're going to do now. So I'm, I'm encouraging everybody to get out there and give it a try and, and contact the minister because there's lots of funding that can help you and your business. Thank you. The uh, leader of the third party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you for announcing the opening of the Ignition Fund. I think that um, it's really important for us as a province to, to channel and support the innovation and creativity of islanders and support them so that we may show PEI on, on a world stage for creativity, for innovation through our products, through, through the ideas of, of islanders. Um, and I look forward to seeing how this kind of coincides with the new vision for the startup zone. Um, because I, I'm going to call it the new vision for the startup zone, the restart of the startup zone based on what the minister had said. Because I think that it's really important that we, that we support these, uh, these innovative spaces to, to encourage and inspire that creativity and innovation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Presenting and receiving petitions. Tabling of documents. The member for Borden Kinkora. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I have four. I'll try and move quickly through them as I can. Uh, by leave of the House, uh, Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to table a statement from the Canadian Medical Association entitled CMA urges all employers to discontinue requirement for sick notes during COVID-19 and I move seconded by the leader of the third party that said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall carry. Uh, next, uh, Mr. Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table a Canadian Medical Association commentary entitled Four Ways Governments Can Improve Healthcare in 2024, one way being to limit the use of sick notes, and I move seconded by leader of the third party, the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall carry. Carry. Member for Borden Kinkora. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. By leave of the House, I beg leave to table a position statement on sick notes for minor illness as prepared by the Canadian Association of Emergency Physicians, and I move seconded by leader of the third party, the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall carry. Carry. The member for Borden Kinkora. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. By leave of the House, I beg leave to table a CBC News uh, website article entitled White Coat Black Art is a Time to Ditch Sick Note Requirements, which I would note uh, relies extensively on some uh, commentary from Dr. Kay Dingwell, who will be joining us a little bit later this afternoon. And I move, seconded by leader of the third party, member, uh, sorry, the second. I move, seconded by leader of the third party, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall it carry? Carry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Reports by committees. Introduction of government bills. Motions other than government. Orders other than government. The member for Charlottetown West Royalty. Mr. Speaker, I move, seconded by O'Learian Inverness, that the 26th order of the day be now read. Shall it carry? Yes. Order 26, an act to amend the Farm Machinery Dealers and Vendors Act, Bill Number 110, in committee. Uh, the member for Charlton West Royalty. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by O'Leary and Irvines that this House do now resolve itself in the committee of the whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Shall it carry? Yes. I'll ask the member for Charlton Winslow to chair committee of the whole. Thank you, member.
The House is now in committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be intituled an act to amend the Farm Machinery Dealers and Vendors Act. Uh, the uh, promoter has indicated that he does not have a stranger. We were open to general questions on this bill currently under debate. Are there any questions? Shall Charlotte, how much royalty? Yeah, just to, to uh, pick up yesterday, I learned a lot too. I was in one of the, the committees and, and it was fantastic. And I also learned this at, at kind of regional conferences that you went to with the right of repair, and this is a number of years ago. Um, and hearing, I, I remember there was, uh, I think it was Michael Couture was on there and he talked very highly about what was what was happening and where things were going. But, but just in your mind, what, what kind of organizations would not be supportive of something like this? Well, I, Chair, I, uh, yeah. I, I'm assuming it would be th those that are the manufacturers and uh, owners of those particular companies. If you look at the person who owns the device or owns a machine, in this particular case we're talking farm machinery, um, they, they would be the ones that are advocating for something to be done in the light that there's you know, pending future problems coming as technology advances. And, uh, you know, I, I had uh, the opportunity to uh, chat a little more on the matter uh, yesterday. Just I did contact the DEI Federation of Agriculture just to confirm that they were still supportive of such a, a bill or legislation to uh, protect farmers' interests in that. And they certainly conveyed to me that they are, nothing has changed from their, their time with it. And in fact, they, they uh, talked about, like I say, if we talk about the right to repair or legislation that, uh, uh, you know, there's certainly different ways you can go about this. I mean, we are specifically focusing on farm machinery. Um, the Canadian Federation of Agriculture also advocates for so-called right to repair legislation in, in its various forms. And as well as the uh, Canadian Canola Growers and the Canadian Grains Council have also been uh, on record to be supportive of, of similar things. So it, it really boils down to the, the owner of the machine versus the manufacturer of the machine or, or the device and whatever it might be. And uh, you're, you're going to have a variances of opinions on that is the reality of it. And uh, I, I would argue that as our committee, I think that was something I did want to note. It was, I guess, insinuated that I was sort of driving the committee. I want to emphasize I am the chair of the committee. I didn't even have to vote in any of the situations. All of the committee, if any decisions were made, I would say they were pretty well made. You, you know, uh, I don't want to say unanimously would be the word, but in word. consultation, everybody sort of agreed in the direction that we went forward on. I simply read the report, and it was adopted by this legislature, uh, to which then I'm including that report recommendations in the, the amendments that I was proposing, of which one passed and one did not. Charles, how much royalty? Yeah, and I mean, it's sat on lots of committees, and I think it's been, a, it's, I've always experienced it a fair process, and the staff has always been great, um, putting those together, and, and that we have do, we have the time to do that, and it's obviously it's in camera and stuff. How many hours did that committee meet on this for, do you think, in your estimate as a chair? How many? Uh. I don't know if I could answer that, but we certainly had all the meetings that we could squeeze in. I mean, we, I think we were considered a very active committee. Uh, we're, we had a mandate from the legislature to uh, review this piece of legislation. Uh, this legislation, uh, like I say, we did as a committee go through the process. In fact, I even remember the member from Rustico Emerald uh, in uh, when I uh, tabled the the. Uh, Report, you know, you gave quite a, an eloquent uh, comment on how well the system worked as mm -hmm. far as uh, the consultation process and how we looked at uh, coming up with these particular amendments. Um, you know, so I would say, you know, everybody had their say. We certainly did whatever we could. I see the clerk is here with us. Uh, she did tremendous work. I want to really commend her and thank her. B because as she would attest, it, it, it was difficult to always get a hold of everybody. We sent out letters and emails and phone calls, and we did get lots of feedback. We got feedback from present presenters. We also got feedback from uh, in written form, and there were some cases, if I think of Kensington Agriculture, we got no feedback. So I don't know what, how far do you keep going and trying to uh, get uh, these, uh, you know, respondents to respond. <laughs> so. Uh, I suppose we can subpoena it, but I, I don't think we, or I guess at least our committee didn't feel that we had to go to that level to get their feedback. So, and, uh, you know, if I look at the Federation of Agriculture, 
you know, they read through this bill many times. They, you know, they took it to their their annual meeting, and uh, they seemed, you know, generally supportive and, and stated so in in the committee. So, Charles, how much Riley? Yeah, and just just going back. So I asked you before who was not in support of you said you said companies, but but so the farmers would be would be very much in support of something like this. Would, would you agree? Well, we, you know, I can't say I speak for every farmer, but no, <laughs> you know, uh, but but I'll say in, in general, if I look at the organizations that tend to represent many of the firm commodities, and I would put the Federa PEI Federation of Agriculture and the Canadian Federation of Agriculture as uh, very credible organizations when it comes to uh, it, the interest of the farm community, and uh, they uh, they made it very clear they were supportive and and. Uh, did so yesterday after uh, you know watching the proceedings. So you know you, you just you do what you can. I think as a committee, and I, I certainly would say as the chair of the committee, I cannot believe we denied anybody or said no, we're not bringing that group or person in. Or you know we asked for the committee members who were appointed by this legislature, and it was all parties. Uh, we had observing members; they all had input. I don't think anybody was restricted from getting anybody in that they would want in. So, and after we went through that process, you know, uh, the clerk, uh, you know, we had uh, consulted uh, our legislative uh, writer of legislation on private members' bills, and he did good work, and I, I did speak with him this morning and thanked him for the work that he, he had done. I don't look at any of the issues on the amendment getting turned down or a reflection of him. He did what he thought was right, and... Uh, such as the decisions of the legislature. Mm -hmm. Charles Thomas Rowley. Well, so there was talk in the debate yesterday, which I thought was very fascinating. Anytime you get a chance to talk about this, and, and you know, we're, we're trying to make legislation that, that works now, but also more or less works in the future for, for people who are farming. But there was a lot of talk in here about the word flaws and everything that, w that came about. I didn't, I, I, I was on the floor there earlier um, a few weeks ago, and same kind of thing. I, I got, it seemed like there was flaws, but I, I don't know. You're bringing legislation forward to deal with things for islanders, for islanders, for our farmers, for people, for, for whatever, and that's the process. Can you talk to me a little bit about what happened yesterday with the flaws? And well, well, I'm going to clarify. I never said that there were flaws in the legislation as presented. I said if there are flaws in the legislation, uh -huh. and all legislation, we have a whole litany of pieces of legislation that are amended to repair any particular issue that uh, was either deemed a flaw, a wording change, or, uh, or that it isn't reaching the outcome that was desired by the government. And uh, this would be no different in this. Uh, you know, uh, we, once again, as a committee, reviewed the existing piece of legislation. We had identified, I think it was four items that we wanted to recommend, of which two of them were uh, to the legislation itself, mm -hmm. to which one has passed, the other one did not. Uh, from my perspective, the, the second one that did not pass uh, doesn't really change my influence on the bill because it was, it, you know, the original bill is still basically intact with that one amendment that clarifies the uh, definition of a farmer. So, uh, so I'm that's why I'm proceeding, yeah. I guess, with the bill. It may still, you know, I, I respect the wishes of this legislature and it, in its infinite wisdom felt that there shouldn't be a uh, cap on what a machine gets obsolete. But if this bill proceeded, it would be to the responsibility of the Minister of Agriculture to uh, implement the regulations. And in that regulations, maybe they would see that there's some way to uh, uh, cap that. Uh, maybe it's a longer, uh, an older machine would be capped at, or, or newer. <laughs> so uh, there's really not much there that would restrict anybody uh, in that, that little piece of uh, amendment in not passing. Charles, how much, Riley? I was going to say, I want to thank the member for bringing this forward. Uh, the right to repair is something that needs to be talked about more. And I think that this debate and however it goes, it goes. But you've done a great job of bringing this forward and bringing this, bringing this attention to this important thing for the right to repair, but more importantly for farmers in Prince Edward Island. So thank you, member. Thanks. Thank you, member. Shall the bill carry? No. Yay. Yay. Um, I'll ask one more time. Shall the bill carry? Yay. Yes. Yay. I've heard more nays. Unfortunately, member, your bill does not pass. That's the way it goes sometimes, Chair. <laughs> you win some, you lose some. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the Chair and that the Chair report the bill not recommended. Shall I carry? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
Mr. Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having, him, uh, having had under consideration a bill to be intituled an act to amend the Farm Machinery Dealers Vet and Vendors Act, uh, I beg leave to report that the committee has gone through the said bill, does not recommend same to the Legislative Assembly. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Shall carry. Honourable members, there's been a standing vote uh, recorded division requested. Uh, Sergeant Arm, can you ring the bells? The opposition is ready for the vote, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member. The uh, third party is ready for the vote, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Uh, government is ready for the vote, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. All right, Members. <clears throat> All those voting against the report of the committee, please stand. <laughs> Member from Borden, King Cora. The, mem the Honourable Leader of the Third Party, the Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition, the Honourable Member from New Haven Rocky Point, the Member from O'Leary and Burness. Members, all those voting in favour of the report of the committee, please stand. Minister of Education, Minister of Finance, the Honourable Premier, Minister of Agriculture, the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action, the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, Member from Charlottetown Winslow, the Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture, the Minister of Workforce Advanced Learning and Population, the Minister of Social Development and Seniors, the Minister for Economic Development, Innovation and Trade, the Minister of Health and Wellness, the member from Rustico Emerald, the member from Surrey Elmira, member from Summerside Wilmot, the member from Tyne Valley Sherbrooke, the member from Charlottetown Belvedere. Members, the year report of the committee uh, has been adopted. The uh, member for Charlottetown West Royalty. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This time I call uh, motion number 51. Shall carry? Carry. carry. Motion 51. The Leader of the Opposition moves, seconded by the Member for Charlottetown West Royalty, the following motion. Whereas timely access to emergency medical services is of the utmost importance for all the well for the well-being of the citizens of Prince Edward Island. And whereas transparency and public awareness of ambulance response times are critical to understanding and improving emergency services in the province. And whereas making ambulance response time data publicly available will empower citizens with information to better advocate for improvements in emergency medical services. And whereas transparent and accessible information about ambulance wait times is crucial for public awareness and accountability. 
Therefore, be it resolved that the Legislative Assembly requests the government of Prince Edward Island to establish a system for publishing ambulance response times on an official government website. Therefore, be it further resolved that the Legislative Assembly urges the government to make this data easily ac accessible to the public and ensure that the published information is updated in a timely and accurate manner. And therefore, be it further resolved that the Legislative Assembly calls on the government to embrace transparency and accountability by providing the citizens of Prince Edward Island with access to ambulance response time data. Thank you, members. Uh, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So I rise today with a sense of urgency and uh, determination to address a matter of paramount importance, and that is timely access to emergency medical services in our beloved province of Prince Edward Island. It's not the first time I've ever stood up in this house and um, talked about uh, this issue of having um, timely access to emergency medical services, whether it's uh, the closures at the ER at the Western Hospital in Alberton or um, uh, ambulance response times and ambulance response times is basically what we're asking for in this motion is so that we have Islanders have an opportunity to know how long the wait will be for an ambulance to attend to them uh, in the case of an emergency. 2024, you know, um, we talk about technology advancing every day. Uh, this is something that could be easily Im implemented. Uh, by the province, uh, and I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, and it is undeniable that timely access to emergency medical services is not just a matter of convenience, but a fun fundamental right that directly impacts the health, the safety, and the well-being of every islander. In times of crisis, uh, every minute matters, and the ability to quickly summon medical assistance can mean the difference between life and death. Yet. Despite the critical nature of this issue, there remains a glaring lack of transparency and accountability when it comes to ambulance response times in our province. As we stand here today, Islanders are left in the dark, uncertain of how long it will take for paramedics to arrive during their moment of greatest need. This, is, uh, this uncertainty only serves to uh, exacerbate the anxiety and fear that accompanies any medical emergency. And Mr. Speaker, this is by no way um, anything negative towards any of the paramedics. It's the system itself um, that is flawed, and it needs to be fixed, uh, and it needs to be fixed uh, immediately. Far too many people, and I, I, I just mentioned that I stood up in this house, and I remember reading a statement one day from one of my constituents who had to wait uh, over, I think it was an hour and a half for response to her father laying on the floor um, who, who was dying and eventually did die. And that's not what any Islander or any family should ever have to endure. But why should Islanders be kept in the dark about something as crucial as ambulance response times, uh, Mr. Speaker? I just mentioned that. People need to know, they need to have the assurance that when they call, for medical uh, help, medical support, that it will be there in, in a timely manner. They need to know when that uh, help is going to arrive. Decisions have to be made then, um, depending on what time that, uh, that, that may be. So I mentioned you know, about technology ever advancing in an, in an age where technology has made real-time information readily available um, at our fingerprints. Shouldn't Islanders have the same level of transparency when it comes to their own safety and their own well-being? So consider for a moment the simple act of ordering a meal from a restaurant or requesting a ride from a transportation service. Companies like Domino's, Skip the Dishes, and Carry provide customers with real-time updates on the status of their order or ride, giving them peace of mind and alleviating any anxiety about how long they will have to wait. Wouldn't that be wonderful for Islanders to have access to that technology so they know, in case of an emergency, when that ambulance or whenever that service that's required uh, in an emergency um, will be there? You know, shouldn't Islanders have that same level of transparency when it comes to something as vital as ambulance service, Mr. Speaker? So furthermore, I want to emphasize the disproportionate impact of this lack of transparency on rural communities in particular, where wait times for ambulance services has been alarmingly long, sometimes stretching for two hours or more. 
In these rural areas, every minute spent waiting for help to arrive feels like an eternity and the consequences can be and have been very devastating. Again, I'm going to go back to how many times I've stood in this house over the past few years uh, asking for an, an, someone to address these issues of uh, faster response times. Um, so we have a contract with a private company to deliver a service uh, to Islanders, and in that we expect to have timely access to our medical needs, and in particular, in this case, medical emergencies and ambulance response times. So imagine the anguish of a family in, in, in a rural community. I've, I've lived this. I've, I've been part of uh, many families who have gone through this, that they waited anxiously, anxiously for paramedics to arrive during a medical emergency. So imagine the frustration of knowing that help is desperately needed, but not knowing how long it's going to take to arrive. Now, this is not just an inconvenience, Mr. Speaker. It's a matter of life and death in many situations. Islanders, uh, they don't deserve this. And again, I, I, I have, I know paramedics who are working in our system here in Prince Edward Island who do a wonderful job. And they don't do it for the paycheck. They do it because they have that desire to help Islanders. Every day they go to work. They don't go to work for, just for the paycheck. They go because they want to give back to, to uh, their community, uh, give back to Islanders. They want to care for people. These are people that, uh, again, are there for Islanders when they need them. But paramedics, they also need that, that assistance. They need more supports um, from government. They need more supports from the companies uh, that they work for. Mr. Speaker, I often get messages from paramedics and they're upset because they may be waiting for an offload at a hospital um, and cannot respond to a medical emergency five minutes down the road. So I'll give you a, an example. There could be someone waiting at the Western Hospital in Alberton, uh, an ambulance, waiting to offload. They cannot leave until the doctor sees that patient. So there could be a medical emergency called in five minutes down that road. They can't respond. They're sitting there. They, they want to respond, but they can't respond. An ambulance has to be called in from Hunter River, Charlottetown, and, and at times even Montague. That's unfair, Mr. Speaker. And Islanders deserve to know that in a case like that, there could be a decision made. If I knew as, as a... I guess one of my friends or my family were in a situation like that and I was there and I knew that ambulance response time was only going to be an hour, an hour and a half, I would have to make a decision. Put that person in the car and go to the air myself. I would, I would definitely not sit around and wait an hour and a half if somebody was having a serious medical uh, emergency that needed attention immediately. But to know that maybe the ambulance might be there in seven minutes time, 10 minutes time, 15 minutes time, is going to give me the assurance that yes, you know what, help is on, on, on the way. Let's just take a deep breath, wait for them to get here. Everything will be, hopefully, will be fine in that case. And, and like I said, sometimes it's a matter of life and death. And a lot of times this doesn't go uh, reported, uh, Mr. Speaker. What we need to do is have a system that is accountable, but transparent at the same time. So um, with that, I also want to emphasize the disproportionate impact of this lack of transparency on our rural communities, as, the, as I just mentioned. Imagine, um, you know, I keep saying it over and over again because I, I've talked to these families. I've been there. And so I know how they feel, and I, I just don't ever want any other islander to ever have to experience these long wait times and the frustration and, and when they're in a desperate situation like that. It's not an inconvenience, Mr. Speaker. It's a matter of life and death. So therefore, I, I urge all my fellow members of this assembly to support this motion and let us send a very clear message to the government of Prince Edward Island that transparency and accountability in emergency medical services are non-negotiable. I mentioned earlier about uh, DoorDash and, and Carrie. So when you, when you have the app with Carrie and you're looking for a, uh, um, 
for lack of a better word, a taxi service to or a drive to somewhere, the, you know, you know exactly how far away, and you can track it. You can track it and where they're at, what streets they're at. There's no reason why Islanders cannot have access to uh, that information uh, with ambulance response times. And that's, that's what basically what I'm asking for in this motion. So let us all stand united in our commitment to ensuring that every Islander, regardless of where they live here in Prince Edward Island, has access to timely and reliable ambulance services when they need it the most. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I look forward to hearing from other <coughs> members. Thank you, Member. Uh, the member for Charlton West Royalty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, uh, Member, for moving this important motion. We've talked to, in this legislature a lot about um, EMS services and, and what's uh, what the public's going to get. Nothing is really more important, I think, to Islanders than knowing um, knowing when and when where you're going to get support and help, and having the great services of EMS there and, and understanding that. When you look at the response times in Prince Edward Island, they're reported on quarterly. So every three months, they're reported on. So we'll see them every three months mm -hmm. in, a, in a document. Um, that, that's, that's good for statistics. That's good that the, this information is being reported. But we need, that, we need that immediately. And we've all heard about people, when you get there and a, so, somebody doesn't know when the ambulance is going to come, they were like, get in the car. Do what you have to, we gotta get going. We have to go to the hospital, we have to move. And that's what we're trying to avoid is that if people knew when they were gonna get there, they could make an informed decision. They could, they could understand when, when they were gonna get support and help when they need it. When you look at the stats from last year in April 1st to June 30th, 2023, I'm just going to use Charlottetown for, for coverage in Charlottetown. You don't you think, okay, well, it's, it's here, it's close to the hospital. Yes, and it's not nearly the same as rural Prince Edward Island. But it's the volume in Charlottetown. It's the, it's the volume that's, that's kind of the issue here. So and during that time, from Charlottetown, the response time to get to where you were during that three-month period was 13 minutes and 17 seconds. Um, so that is... That's actually, there's, there's, there's quite a few more places, and I, hopefully other members talk about them, but my writing's in Charlottetown, so I want to talk about that for the people that, that I represent. And there were 1,745 calls, 1,745 calls in a three-month period, and that's 36% of the volume across the island was here. So it's those type of things that you, you can get that information on that three-month window on the website right now, but what you can't get is when you call when the ambulance is coming. And you can't get that in Prince Edward Island. And we have to make sure we uh, invest in the technology around that. Other places do it. Um, and as the, the mover of the motion said, other places do it um, for in, the, in, in different sectors and for different things. It's, it's that information. And the, the kind of one of the last points that I'm going to make here in this important motion um, is that the EMS services have changed. You should also know what, if you're going to get a transport um, or if you're going to get a vehicle that's going to provide you service at where it's, where it's coming. Now there, we have different kinds of vehicles with different kinds of services that are being transported and, and relayed to uh, the people in Prince Edward Island. Some are transport, some are not. So that should be included too in the information. Um, and that, that's really important. And the triage service and what you're going to get uh, is very, very important because in a time of need, when somebody around you might be going into shock and you might be going into shock and it's a very scary time, we have to know that when you say to a person, take a deep breath, okay, help is on the way. And if that help can get there as soon as we can and they know that, it's going to make our island safer and it's going to make the people that need the service be able to have that peace of mind. And I think that's very important. So I look forward to it and I'm honored to, to, uh, to move this uh, motion as a seconder and I look forward to what everybody else has to say. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Surrey Elmira. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank you to my colleagues here for putting this motion forward and for speaking to it. and. Uh, Talking so highly of the, the paramedics that uh, that uh, do keep our island safe, and uh, you know this is a little unique for me because I've got uh, I've got a little more inside information and perspective on this issue than than anyone here in this uh, 
in this legislature. And uh, in fact, both my daughters are working today uh, as as paramedics. So a pretty proud moment for me. Um, while I agree with a lot of what the members are are saying, there there are a few things that I that I need to highlight here, uh, and and help everyone in this legislature and anyone that's watching uh, understand. So, when someone calls nine one one, immediately they are getting help. They are getting professional help, advice, and care. And that's in our 911 dispatchers who are now emergency medical dispatchers trained when they take your call to start rendering care and advice to the person that's called looking for assistance. So that starts at the point of calling 911. And that help and advice and guidance can make the difference of life and death in many of these emergency situations. So that's very, very important to know. Um, we have to talk about our fire departments that respond to these 911 calls. So if the ambulance is out of the area uh, and depending on the response level of each department, you will get a response by a highly trained group of uh, medical uh, professionals, uh, medical first responders on fire departments. And many of our fire departments have paramedics that are also a part of that fire department. I'll use Surrey Fire Department, uh, Mr. Speaker, for one. Um, when a 911 call comes in, uh, if it's a life-threatening emergency, the fire department gets dispatched with the ambulance. If the ambulance is going to have an extended response time, the fire department gets dispatched automatically, regardless of how significant the call is. And uh, you'll either get uh, one or two paramedics, myself being one, or a number of uh, very highly trained medical first responders that will begin to render care immediately and, and our response time uh, is, is, is very good. Uh, we usually roll within two or three minutes of receiving a 911 call. So those are, those are two of the resources that you will get when you pick up the phone and call 911. They're very important. They can make the difference between life and death. I've experienced it uh, both as the paramedic and arriving on scene and seeing that the emergency medical dispatcher gave the right advice, the right information to assist in saving that life long before we arrived. I've been a part of that life-saving intervention as a firefighter uh, that has literally saved a life prior to EMS arriving. So where I'm going with this is that Although I do agree that we uh, have, a, have a problem, we, we need to lower our response times with EMS. That's no secret. Uh, any of my colleagues uh, on, on our side of the government will know that I have been advocating since elected and prior to when uh, the Minister of Transportation was the Minister of Health, we had conversations. And I, I am advocating for that, and we, we realize that, that that we do need to, to improve. And, and, and a lot of the issues that we're facing are outside of government's control. They're, they're workforce related, much as a lot of the issues that, that we have in healthcare and, and construction and every other industry in, in, in the province. Um, and we are taking steps. Uh, you know, our, our new hires, many of those have had their education paid for and a uh, 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 service contract signed for the next two years. Uh, my daughter is one of those. Um, so we are attracting and keeping more of those paramedics that have graduated from, from the program. Uh, we've got four new ambulances coming to put those new hires in, which is going to make a difference. 
we have uh, CPRUs, uh, they're critical patient response units that are out there in the field and reducing um, response times. And uh, the leader of the opposition had stated that, you know, uh, are you getting uh, a single SUV or, or are you getting a transport unit? And when someone is dealing with a life or death situation, um, I am quite happy to see either one of those arrive on scene because mm -hmm. uh, care starts immediately and, and a level of care that, uh, that, that, you know, would be comparable to any small emergency room in, in our rural hospitals. So the highest level of care is, is being rendered. So those are some of the things that the government uh, and Island, Island DMS is doing to help alleviate the strain on our system help get the delivery of healthcare services to our patients that call 911 faster, and, uh, and they are making a difference. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I have to disagree with, uh, with you know, what's been said in here today is, uh, I, I agree, I believe in accountability, uh, I do, but one of, the, one of the big things that scare me with um, having response times posted um, and one of the members here said it that you know you got to make a decision whether I'm going to throw them in the car and I'm going to drive to the nearest ER. So, so that scares me for a number of reasons. Um, I do not want someone that thinks they're suffering from a heart attack jumping behind the wheel of their car because they looked online and seen holy smokes, it's going to take 20 minutes or even 10 minutes or two hours, whatever it might be. And, and it was stated in here that, that minutes feel like hours. So perhaps it's a 10-minute response time and, and that person says, I can't wait that long. I have to get to the hospital. They jump behind the wheel of their car and they get halfway to the hospital without calling 911 because you know what, there's no point because the ambulance is going to take too long to get there and they suffer that heart attack. And they die on the side of the road because there's, there's no one coming. Or they drive into oncoming traffic and kill a car load of, or a van load of kids going to a sporting event or school. And perhaps they're not taking a heart attack, but their adrenaline is pumping. They're filled with anxiety, and they're driving too fast. They go off the road. They go through a stop sign because they're hyper-focused on getting to the hospital because, because they need help. There are so many reasons why someone making a decision based on an online number that's posted, there are so many reasons why that is such a bad idea. Then I'll go to the loved one that looks at the online posting and decides they're not going to wait to call 911. They're transporting their loved one to the hospital. It's a terrible thing to have someone that you love die beside you because you didn't get to the hospital in time, right? Um, you didn't call 911 because the response time was too long. There are so many reasons why I can't overemphasize why you need to call 911, why you need to stay put until help arrives, because immediately upon calling 911, you're going to get an emergency medical dispatcher that's going to help you with your emergency. You're going to get a highly trained fire department respond and start immediate care. And you're safest nine times out of ten where you're at waiting for help to arrive. So those are some of the reasons why real-time data can be quite dangerous, quite deadly. And uh, we, do, we do post our, our numbers quarterly. Um, is, it, is it quite often enough? I'm not sure, but it's a benchmark. It's, uh, it's accountability. It shows, uh, you know, quite blatantly that, that it's not good enough that it needs to improve. I know that better than anyone. 
uh, Surrey Fire Department right now is uh, uh, we've got the uh, um, the highest number of uh, calls to medical first responder calls because of that response time. So, um, you know, it's a role that we happily take on. We take it very seriously. We've helped a lot of people. But, yes, we do need to reduce those response times. Um, aside from that, that's really what I wanted to, to say. I want to take the opportunity to emphasize the important work that our uh, emergency medical dispatchers do in 911, our fire departments do, and of course our paramedics. Um, and I also want to acknowledge the passion that, that my members beside me here have in, in, in this, this issue. It, it, because it is an important one to talk about, it is an important one to advocate for, and, and I know that they're doing it from, from a good place for sure. And really, uh, Mr. Speaker, that is, that's about all I wanted to add uh, to, to the conversation. And, and I guess um, we don't want the general public or, or people like most of us in this house that are not qualified to make real-time health care decisions doing so, right? My message is call 911. You will get help immediately upon that phone call and, and help will come to you. So thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you all. The Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Honourable Member uh, from District 1 for his comments. Um, again, very knowledgeable, of course, as he's as he's uh, he's ridden in an ambulance more times than, than he could than we can count. So I, I appreciate. I learned something from from the honourable member every time we talk about uh, ambulance services and, and even healthcare related um, services. So I am pleased to rise now today to support this motion. Again, as it, it's written, it says it refers to reliable and timely uh, information. Um, the honourable member did a great job of explaining how real-time information may um, actually have negative outcomes um, with regards uh, to that. So I do feel it's important in the name of transparency and public awareness that we share publicly ambulance uh, response time. And uh, as, as we've stated before, we already do this. So currently staff within our Emergency Health Services Division post ambulance uh, response times on our provincial government website regularly, and they will continue to do so. Um, these ambulance uh, response times are reported quarterly and reflect information gathered over a three-month time frame. In addition to the response times, the quarterly reports include the total number of ambulance calls for each coverage zone during the period and what percentage of provincial, uh, provincial calls that reflects. The report also includes the five most common pre-hospital ambulance calls. We've had a discussion today about long-term care beds and offload delays, and obviously um, if we are able to decant uh, people from our hospital system, that will improve our ambulance uh, response times. So again, as we know in healthcare, everything is very uh, linked together and it has a, a relationship. So again, as we make those investments, uh, we'll see improvements in our ambulance response times. Um, and also, Mr. Speaker, it's important to note that although ambulance response times are one indicator of service performance, they are not always indicative of quality of care. Other indicators include properly identifying requests, making appropriate transportation decisions, reducing patient pain, and determining the survival rate after hospital admission. The Department of Health and Wellness monitors all aspects of service and delivery by Allen EMS. And as the Honourable Member from District 1 um, alluded to, we have uh, ordered new ambulance, uh, ambulance units to increase the size of our, our fleet. Um, the tuition program um, will have some impacts on our workforce. I um, asked this question the other day, is that in this spring we have 18 PCB, PCPs uh, graduating along with um, eight ACPs coming out of uh, the Holland College program. I reached back another year to those first year students and, and I'm pleased to report that we have 31 PCPs uh, enrolled in the two year program and 11 ACPs. So again, 
Um, we talked about the funnel of, of, of recruitment. Um, we are starting to fill up the funnel in order to staff these additional units. So again, that will uh, allow us to provide uh, better response times uh, on PEI. So they are great investments. It's another competitive marketplace. We're fortunate that we have Holland College in that program that trains here. Uh, that certainly um, the free tuition program does have a return and service component. So we hope, uh, you know, as they practice here that they'll uh, set up their family here and stay for, for quite a long time uh, after they finish that program. So in closing, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Island EMS is a valued partner, and it's crucial that we work collaboratively in the delivery of emergency health care services. So thank you for the time to speak to this motion. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Are there any other members wishing to speak to the motion? Uh, the member for Willary and Verness. Uh, yeah, I just want to make uh, some quick uh, comments on this because, uh, once again, O'Leary, as I look at the numbers, we have the second worst response times uh, comparable to Surrey, uh, although Surrey is quite a bit behind us. But, uh, you know, the reality is uh, that's a concern for me as a, as a member for the legislature. I would like my constituents to be treated fairly uh, when it comes to response times, and I do feel that... Uh, by publishing our response times, it does uh, allow, I think the member from Surrey Elmire made some great comments and I sort of get that side of it. But I'd like to see at least the, the response times being published in a timely manner. Uh, so, you know, we still don't have our first quarter of 2024 published yet, although we're a little over a month in from, from that. Uh, so I would hope that they would try to do them within the month anyway. And I have lots of situations where I've seen uh, ambulances uh, the 911 call, and I have a situation in one of my constituents in Cape Wolf called, and uh, they uh, waited and waited and waited and waited, and then another hour went by, so we're into about an hour and a half, and they decided when they called uh, back again, just said, we're going to go on our own, and they drove on their own. It wasn't a, a case where, you know, an hour and a half later and still no response time um, at all, that they have no alternative. I, I totally get the member's point. You don't want to be... Uh, driving under a, you know, a bad medical situation, but the husband did take the opportunity to drive <coughs> his wife into the emergency room in, in Albert, and, and they, they literally had no other choice. So I just want to emphasize that. So in general, I will be supporting the motion, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member. I'll go back to the mover of the motion, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank all of those who took the time to uh, stand in this house and speak to this very, very important motion. Um, and in no way am I, am I questioning uh, paramedics or, or uh, first responders or fire departments. I understand, in, especially in, in, in my area, how important the role of first responders from the fire department really, really is. There are times it's, it's actually overwhelming for many of these uh, volunteer fire um, fighters, Mr. Speaker, uh, who are first responders. They are called out almost every second day, if not sometimes every day, to a medical emergency, and they are there for uh, the people in their, in their area. And huge, huge thank you and appreciation to each and every one of them uh, right across the island. Um, so this motion was brought forward out of, again, concern for uh, timely access in a medical uh, emergency for Islanders. It was also brought forward in conversations that I've had with paramedics who suggested this very thing to me. So I um, acted upon it because I thought, yeah, it might be something to to alleviate some of the pressures for even some of the, and I go back to the volunteer fire departments and the, and the firefighters who are first responders, who are first on scene, they would also like to know, <coughs> is, that, is that ambulance coming? Is that backup coming within 10 minutes? Is it 15 minutes? Is it a half hour, an hour and a half, two hours? And I think it's a right that they, that they know that, uh, Mr. Speaker. So I know that they put in many, many hours uh, and again, I'm not going to you know, go on too much about it. I do appreciate everything they do. So this motion was brought forward uh, by myself and was seconded by the Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty as a request in conversations that I know personally had um, with paramedics who thought having like, given Islanders an opportunity to know that the ambulance is, and if the ambulance is five minutes away, great, 
That's fantastic. That, that, that will alleviate some of the anxiety that these individuals um, have during the time of an emergency. That's all we're asking for. Is this, it's 2024. The technology is readily available. Just asking for this province to implement, um, um, I guess, timely um, response times for ambulance services on mm -hmm. monitors so that there is an, an accountability and a transparency uh, portion uh, to it. So, um, Mr. Speaker, just looking through my notes to make sure I didn't miss anything on it. Um, anyway, I just, I just hope that from the comments that we're going to have support um, on, uh, on this motion, um, and it's calling on the government to embrace transparency and accountability by providing the citizens of Prince Edward Island with access to ambulance response time data. Thank you for that. And with that, Mr. Uh, Speaker, I will um, conclude my remarks and debate on this and call for a vote. Are we ready for the question? All those voting in uh, favor of the motion, please signify, please, uh, signify by saying yay. Yay. All those voting against the motion, please say nay. Honourable Member, your motion has passed and it is uh, carried unanimously. The member for you're going to see time. All right, uh, the member for New Haven, Rocky Point. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. It's uh, uh, the member for Boring Kinkora. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I move, seconded by uh, Leader of the Third Party, that uh, the 28th order of the day be now read. Shall it carry? Carry. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by just uh, uh, honourable member. Third party. Honourable member, just hold on for one one second. Yeah. Order 28, an act to amend an act to amend the Employment Standards Act Bill Number 118, ordered for second reading. The member for Borden Kincora. Sorry and thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. No I move seconded by the uh, leader of the third party that the s said bill be now read a second time. Shall carry. carry. Bill number 118, an act to amend, an act to amend the Employment Standards Act, read a second time. Uh, the member for Boring Kinkora. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move, uh, again seconded by leader of the third party, that this House now do resolve itself into a committee of the uh, whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Shall carry. 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 Honourable members, I'll ask the member for Summerside Wilmot to chair committee of the whole. The House is now in committee of the Hall House to take into consideration a bill to be entitled an act to amend an act to amend the Employment Standards Act. Is it the pleasure of the committee that the bill now be read clause by clause? Oh, I was going to do it next. Did the promoter want to wish to take a stranger to the floor? Uh, I do, uh, Chair. Shall it be permitted? Yes. 
If the stranger could state her name for her answer. I'm Dr. K. Dingwell. Is it the pleasure of the committee that the bill now be read clause by clause? General questions. General questions? I'd have a, just a brief opening statement, Mr. Chair. Carry on. If that's permitted. Permitted. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, everybody. It's my pleasure to, to be here uh, a little earlier in my tenure to be sitting in this hot seat, but uh, that's how uh, things go when there's an important uh, matter to be addressed uh, in the province. Um, then it's our job as legislators to do what we can to, to address it. Uh, so in this particular case, the matter that we're seeking to address is the uh, strain on our uh, health care providers um, to address in some small way, whatever way we can, uh, to alleviate the burden that's placed on, on, our, on our doctors and our, and our phys physician team. I, I will say that this bill did uh, arise organically uh, through the debate in this legislature, as we all know, um, and the uh, Minister of Health can certainly attest. The uh, issue of the, of the sitting primarily has been um, the delivery of health care services in this province. And what we have seen is a burdened health care system uh, that is struggling to meet the needs of islanders and to deliver care to islanders uh, from tip to tip. Uh, I have, uh, through the course of debate, uh, raised various uh, initiatives and concepts that could work to alleviate some of the problems. Uh, admittedly, some of those uh, are larger systemic approaches to the system, uh, system changes, um, and I do acknowledge that some of those take time. So in the effort to do what we can uh, to alleviate uh, immediately uh, a burden on our health care system, uh, that's where this bill arose. And uh, simply put, what the bill uh, does is to eliminate the requirement for sick notes, uh, more formally known as medical certificates, from the Employment Standards Act, uh, as the uh, Act allows for sick days, uh, paid and unpaid, to employees as defined within the legislation. Um, and in so doing that, uh, I think we'll hear uh, from our stranger on the floor um, that that seemingly small measure will actually result in some large or larger benefits uh, on our frontline medical staff um, to improve not only uh, you know their ability to do their jobs but also uh, the lives of patients who need to um, who need to actually seek care uh, for real medical illness and not simply for an administrative paper burden so so with that uh, Mr. Chair, I, I turn the microphone over to the stranger on the floor to deliver some brief remarks. Thank you. I work full time as an emergency room physician at Prince County Hospital in Summerside, a beleaguered but beloved place. Uh, it is a regular event that we have people coming in who do not feel that they need medical assessment for their minor illness, but are presenting to the emergency department for the only reason that they need a work note for a day off work because they have a cold. These are adult individuals who have the judgment to determine that they're too sick to come to work, but their employer is placing a burden on them to come to the hospital, to the walk-in clinic, or if they're one of the islanders fortunate enough to have a primary care physician or nurse practitioner, they are presenting to their offices to request this note. It's often presented as, well, we need to make sure they're actually sick. But the reality is, for minor illnesses, we are not doing any verification that this individual is ill. We are listening to them tell us what's wrong. We are saying, OK, you're sick. You shouldn't go to work today. And we're writing that down, that they need to not go to work today for, for a minor illness. We're not using our healthcare resources to verify that this individual has a minor viral illness. We're not sending off laboratory testing and doing chest x-rays unless they actually need those things. But if a person comes in for a sick note, says I'm sick, I can't go to work today, I'm sorry I'm here, I'm sorry I wasted your time, then we're just confirming that. The, a, a medical certificate for a sick day is nothing more than a confirmation of the request being made. 
These patients are coming in with typically very communicable illness. They're sitting in our waiting room with frail elderly patients, new babies, immunosuppressed individuals who need to be there for other reasons. They're coughing on them. They're using a shared bathroom when they have gastroenteritis, when really these people just need to be at home. And they have the judgment to exercise that and say, I'm too sick to go to work today. Most employers don't require this. But it is very common that we get patients coming in who have no ability to exercise that judgment that they need to stay home. They are telling us they don't need to be there. And then they are having to come in and use this limited healthcare resource to get a paper signed. And when it's consistently reported by physicians and other primary care professionals across the country, that administrative burden is one of the number one reasons of burnout it's one of the number one reasons that people don't want to go into primary care or services. Any amount of reduction of that administrative burden, particularly an unnecessary, outdated thing like a work note for a minor illness, any alleviation of that helps create an environment where we're prioritizing the needs of the population, which is what I'm there for. My job is to serve the health of Islanders. My job is to take care of the person in front of me. It is not to police their attendance for their employer. And it is... Thank you. This is not the vision of the Canada Health Act for physicians to provide services to private business. It is our role to take care of the health of those people to, and to advocate for them. I'm here in my role as an advocate for the population. I want people, when they are sick, to be able to stay home, to not spread that illness to their workplaces, to not spread that illness to my sick patients waiting in the waiting room who actually do need to see me. I want these individuals to be able to exercise their good judgment to determine when they shouldn't be at work and to be able to stay home. Thank you. Uh, so we, committee, we did it, opened it up as general questions. So I will now open the floor for questions. The Minister of Workforce Advanced Learning and Population. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the promoter and our stranger for joining us today. I guess my first question is around when uh, was this bill, like Bill 118, first commissioned for drafting? I don't have the exact date on that, but it was in the sitting of the Legislative Assembly. Thank you. Minister of Workforce Advanced Learning and Population. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so just around public consultation in regards to Bill 118, I'm just um, wondering uh, when that occurred and who were you able to consult with on this change? So as, yep. as, far, as far as the, the, the public consultation uh, is concerned, I, I, I wasn't here, um, uh, but during the fall sitting, uh, the third party had a bill to amend the uh, Employment Standards Act and contained within that bill uh, was this precise pr provision to have the uh, requirement for medical certificates removed. And through the course of that um, bill, uh, extensive consultation uh, was completed. And I believe there was about 42 uh, groups that were approached and uh, feedback was provided by some, of course, but not all. I guess that's normally what happens when consultation occurs. Not everybody responds. Uh, and there was zero uh, response uh, from any of the respondents uh, pertaining to uh, the elimination of sick, bill, uh, sick notes. Excuse me, it wasn't flagged as a concern uh, by any of the people who responded, who, who chose to respond to the request for, for feedback. Minister of Workforce Advanced Learning and Population. Great. Thank you. Um, so just around impacts and what impacts um, would this change have on you know, our collective bargaining process with workers and employers? Uh, none. Minister of Workforce Advanced Learning and Population. Okay. And so... Um, I guess there was extensive uh, work done for over two years on the Employment Standard Act and like through the comprehensive review that involved hundreds um, across the island, uh, workers and employers. So um, with 110 recommendations that came back, two that came back, um, there, there was multiples, but two that are around this uh, medical note um, certainly highlighted increasing days for employers. So. Um, I think a comment I had heard from our stranger is, uh, you know, employees coming in because they're of a, a sick day, they would need 
the require if if the employer is requiring the note, um, it it has to be at minimum three consecutive um, days. What but what would the results from the review said? They would like to see added days to that, as well as expanding. Uh, the scope of who uh, can can fill out a note to help uh, support some of the, the demands of that. So just on that, I guess, um, how does this bill align with the recommendations of those uh, folks that spent the two years and, mm -hmm. and consulted on this? Well, I think I, I, the comment I'd have is as far as expanding who can provide medical certificates, that doesn't address the root of this problem that we're trying to address. We know that there are 36,000 plus uh, people in the province who don't have access to primary care at any level. So simply expanding the eligibility to write sick notes from doctors to nurse practitioners is not going to uh, it's, not, it's, it's not going to help the problem. It's you're still dealing with the same population of patients who don't have access, and you're still dealing with an overburdened healthcare system. Whether we be talking nurse practitioners or doctors, and you're you're welcome to jump in if there's anything anything I'm not adding to that. And I'm already encountering uh, because I have an interest in this area. I, I ask patients a few questions when they do make the request and it is extremely common that despite the way the legislation is currently written as well as the changes that are coming in, I, I have patients telling me they are being required by their employer to request a sick note for a single day off and uh, several employers are regularly refusing notes from, for instance, our unaffiliated virtual care program. And so this essentially leaves the patients with no, you know, are nearly 40,000 patients who have no access to primary care as well as patients of the many primary care professionals who uh, have no, no ability due to them being overburdened to see them on an acute basis. These patients are left with the option of walk-in clinics or eMERGE. And our walk-in clinics are extremely limited and so typically these patients are coming into eMERGE, they're waiting 12 to 14 hours. And, and ultimately, the medical certificate is useless. It is not a reflection of the individual being assessed for illness. It is a reflection only that they have presented to a health professional and made the request. We are not confirming in any way that this person has a routine illness. Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, so on that, I guess, for me, the concerns are around uh, labor relations, uh, for sure. Uh, if employers are, are uh, requiring something that's not part of the Employment Standards Act currently, um, that that's something that that needs to be, uh, I mean, certainly exercised. I would have to think that employers have rights to reach out to um, our department, the labor uh, department, uh, to inquire about that. They can't be forced to get something that's not required. Um, in regards to the medical um, certificates, uh, currently what I would say is that they have the employers have the opportunity to request it. It is not a requirement, and as you had mentioned, that most don't require this. Um, I would hope that those that potentially are using that for one day, that the employers can, employees can feel um, confident enough for me saying today that I, I would like them to reach out if that is happening. I will have somebody help with that. That's uh, they can't be requiring something for one day that's not required by law. <laughs> Most of the patients that this occurs with are, are vulnerable people who are in low wage employment and, and are, are often essentially disenfranchised from any sort of a system to advocate for them. So this, this you know, to, to your question, Minister, this is the opportunity for, for you as Minister and for a government to ensure that those abuses, um, if I can use that word, um, aren't actually taking place in our workforce and all we're all the bill is doing is removing the sick note requirement from the days that are made available in the legislation beyond that the employers are going to be able to continue with whatever policy that they may have or may choose to have in the course of running their business minister of health and wellness uh, thank you chair and thank you to the promoter for coming in. Uh, we, I still owe uh, her a cup of coffee and a visit, um, which I will do when we finish <laughs> in here. Um, a couple of questions. A again, as Minister of Health, uh, obviously uh, myself and the Minister were at odds. I want to reduce any 
administrative burden to, to any healthcare worker uh, of, of possible. So um, I was surprised by the pushback that I received from business when I stated that. I got some very strong um, objections to it, um, which again kind of concerns me, I guess. Um, so the Patient Care Access Act in Nova Scotia. So can you speak to any of the impacts that that's had since it went into effect in July in Nova Scotia? I, I can't myself. I'm not sure if the stranger... Not there. in detail. I'm not especially familiar with the legislation, if there's been any analysis of the legislative impact. Yeah, and I think it's important to do that. Months. Sorry, yeah. Chair. So again, I think it's important, again, um, I, I support the premise, but I do wor worry about an employer's ability for, I'll call progressive discipline, is, is what, as one employer said to me, is that unfortunately um, we have abusers of our system um, that'll never stop. So they were worried. So I'm always, I would be very interested in um, discussing a, a metered or stepped approach to reduce the administrative burden, to eliminate it 100% um, would be, might be, and maybe we have a stepped approach, you know, to, to, to maybe doing that. Respectfully, it's not my job to police the human resources of private business. Absolutely. Oh, I, 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 it is my I, I, job to promote the health and well-being of islanders yep. oh. and to care for the patient in front of me. And it is not, in my view, an yep. appropriate use of the publicly funded health system to promote the human resources concerns of private business. I am sensitive to, the, to them and, and employers' concerns around employee discipline, but that's not my expertise, it's not my role. My role is healthcare. My role is taking care of the sick person in front of me and the people in my waiting room and the system as a whole. It's my job to be a responsible steward of the health resources and to ensure that I'm not putting, seeing a patient put in a position where they're gonna make other people sick and then I'm going to come in with someone septic because their coworker couldn't take a day off. And I do see this, we do see clusters of illness that occur because patients have to go to work sick because they can't get a note. Yeah. No, and I agree, and again, back to my reference to the patient care access where my understanding is, you know, they included nurses, dentists, pharmacists, physiotherapists, again, which are healthcare providers which do provide services like you described, that they've broadened the scope for people to, to access notes when required. So I guess my only comment, I agree with you, but I think, I think the parameters need to be looked at to eliminate it wholeheartedly, I think is, I think is, is would be a significant change in back to collective agreements and employment standards and stuff like that, which we did a comprehensive re review. So mm -hmm. again, after it is concerning to hear that some employers, again, as the minister said, are asking them for them inappropriately. So in my mind, I wrote education down too, like where can we educate our physician community to say to people, that's not appropriate, you shouldn't be here um, to stop it. I don't want to, you know, we don't want you to be the policing of the Employment Standards Act either. But I think, you know, inappropriate sick notes is very concerning to, to the minister and both myself, you yeah. know, as a private employer, yeah. or, you know, if you were an employer. Um, so again, again, back to consultations in, in, you know, chambers of commerce and business groups and stuff who haven't reached out. I've had individual businesses reach out and say, you know, we need, and, and they use that word progressive discipline, that in certain situations, we need to document what is happening so for proper proper dismissal, mm -hmm. right? You know, that chronic absenteeism is is a I believe is a is a uh, appropriate way to dismiss somebody. You know, obviously we nobody as an employer wants to do that. Um, so that's what concerns me. I think I, I wholeheartedly agree with every single thing that both you and the promo, um, the member and the promoter about the premise of it. I just think that from a to do it very suddenly and very as will have ramifications, I think we need to move to more, to a, uh, a yeah. progressive system. We need to, like, if we move the days from three to five to seven or whatever, proportionally, does that reduce your burden of paperwork from yeah. by 50 percent, 70 percent? I don't know. I don't know the, the issue. Um, and this is just for the record, and I don't know the answer. I assume this is a billable uh, activity for a physician? 
No, this is okay. not paid for. Okay. Like we would have to have to have the patient pay for it because this is not a public service. This okay. is not what our our job is. Okay. And uh, it it would be something that there are several. For instance, in Ontario, yeah. um, the Ontario Medical Association has a specific uh, recommended fee for work notes because it is specifically not a publicly provided service. Okay. Great. Right. I, excuse my ignorance. So, I, sorry, I, I'm not I familiar could, with all the billable. Yeah. So so, just. In response to some of some of that, Minister, if I, if I might pick up on that, we're we're expecting our publicly funded healthcare professionals to do free work um, for the purposes of these employer requirements mm -hmm. that um, that the stranger on the floor has indicated uh, is is not resulting. It doesn't. It's not resulting in an improvement to the health of the patient. Uh, sometimes it's an after-the-fact uh, form fill-out for the purposes of meeting the employer's requirements. So we're not actually seeing uh, treatment of the patient. Uh, it's being done uh, for free, and it's tying up uh, time that could be taken for delivering real patient care to, real pa to patients who really need it. Uh, the other thing I'd say, I guess, uh, Minister, you mentioned we should do a uh, a step-by-step -step or a more progressive approach to to to, to implementing such a, a change. Um, I just want to make sure we're talking about exactly what's happening here. And it would take two years for an employee to get five days of leave, sick leave, under the amendments to the Employment Standard Act that are going to come into force in in October. It will take. Uh, 24 months, two full years of employment for that employee to get uh, five sick days. And three of those would be unpaid. So uh, after two years of working, this employee that would be captured by this amendment that I'm bringing uh, would have two, two paid sick days and would have already gone through, let's say it was a new employee Typically, new employees are hired with a three- or a six-month period of probation um, to determine whether that employee is the right fit for the position. So by the time we get to the two-year mark, that employee has already gone through the probationary period, obviously has done the job to the point where the employer feels that the employee is a fit, obviously has earned some degree of trust in the position of employment. Uh, the amended Employment Standards Act is only going to give that employee two sick days paid. So I guess I'm really not sure what the concern is here about abuse in the system when we're talking a very piddly amount of sick days that are even going to be afforded to this particular employee. I'm just I'm not sure uh, where the abuse of that system can be. If you've got an employee who's going to be out for a week or ten days, there's nothing in, in this bill that's stopping the employer from looking uh, and getting a, getting a medical certificate. Minister of Health and Wellness. Go back to the Care Act, and it, it, the way it re it's read there is um, uh, only permitted to request a sick note if an employee has been absent for more than five working days or has already had two absences of five days or less within the last 12 months. So that's again back to my stepped approach, where they've they've not eliminated it, but they've put conditions in to really expand when that may be necessary from an employment perspective. And again, even back to the caught again, if I have my business hat on take my health hat off for a second, that, again, there was some costing discussions about the whole sick day. How much would a sick day cost our, our business community in order to, to amend? And, and again, I guess that's another debate. So, again, I'm full support of anything we can do to, to eliminate administrative burden. Um, yeah, to remove. But, but there's a caveat that, that we need to balance that with uh, the employer expectations that they have, and again, with regards to a call progressive discipline, because that's what the way it was said to me, is that um, they have, they had, they need steps in order to terminate. With again, I'm outside of my scope with the Employment Standards Act to, to to do a termination properly. Nobody likes to do it, but again, if you can document it and say, here's the absenteeism record of of an employee, here's the performance record, so forth, so forth. We made the decision to to. If I may minister, it's, it still is not reflective at all. If someone's coming in telling me they have a cold, I believe them. Yeah. I am yeah. not testing them. I am not doing anything yeah, besides yeah. writing down that this request has been made of me. Yeah. And that is a waste of my time. Mm -hmm. 
and it is never a waste of my time to care for a patient. Mm -hmm. But it is the employer using my time for their ends. True. It is not this individual deciding that they need to see me. Yeah. It is not this individual saying, I require medical care. It is an employer directing the use of the health resources. And that is not what our public system is for. That is not what my job is nope. to do. I am nope. not a human resources professional. Nope. I'm a doctor. I'm there to take care of sick people. Yep. I'm not there to tell someone that they're too sick to go to work today or that they need two or three days off. I'm there to give them recommendations for managing their health. And while I can respect that private businesses have concerns, that's still not a problem for the health system to solve. That is not what our job is in the emergency department, in the primary care office, in the pharmacy, in the physiotherapist's office, to, to tell this person who has a minor illness that they shouldn't go to work today. If we're talking about a longer term disability, fine. We're talking about adaptations, fine. That is a medical conversation that needs to happen. But for someone to exercise their good judgment about a minor illness, for this adult individual to say, I'm too sick to go to work today, I have a cold, to force them into a position where they are putting other patients at risk, where they are putting themselves at risk. I've personally been at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital at midnight on a Sunday when I worked at a call center because I couldn't get the day off without a sick note. And there I was, four months pregnant, very sick with a viral illness where I just needed to be at home, taking some fluids and resting. And I had to be there because my employer required that note of me. And the next day that they required a note, I went into work sick with a very, very nasty virus where really I should have just been at home. And because I was at work, I wasn't hydrating well and I passed out on my coworker. Because the effect of these requirements is that they are a barrier to people taking time that they're entitled to. They're used in a punitive measure for some patients where the employer decides that they want to force a note. They're, it's often very irregular where they demand them. And these patients are just being forced to go to work sick. That is the effect of these notes, is for an employer to say, I don't trust that you have the judgment to say you need to stay home today, and I'm going to force you to come to work sick. And that's what patients tell me. That's what I'm hearing from the people who I take care of in the emergency department. I'm not hearing, oh, hey, I have a pattern of, of illness my employer wants to make sure so that they don't fire me. It's if I take a sick day today, I'm going to be fired unless I get a note from you. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately, I'm not doing any test. I'm believing the person in front of me. I'm taking care of my patient. My job is not to take care of the business. But if I could also add, uh, Minister, your, I think what you're referring to from the employer's perspective is called papering the file. And you know, I, I, up until a couple of months ago, I, I was uh, an employer in a, in a firm, and I understand generally where the concerns are coming from. Uh, you can paper the file with respect to employee absences and, and behavior without requiring um, proof of what those absences are. If the employee is not coming into the office, that goes in the file. If the employee is uh, not doing his or her job, you know, that gets recorded in the employee's file. We've heard from uh, the stranger on the floor that there is no intrinsic value to the medical note being, uh, being provided. And, and again, if we're talking about abusing the system, abusing the employee-employer relationship to the extent that you might be referring, uh, Minister, uh, we're getting well into unpaid sick days where if the employee is not coming to work, the employee is not getting paid. I don't think there's a bigger deterrent uh, to not coming to work than if you're not going to get paid. So I just want to make sure we're, we're not thinking uh, well outside the box of what this particular bill is, is, is doing. And no, and in the sense, health you know, back to pay if you're a salaried employee, you still get paid. So again, back to, you know, on hourly wages, you get paid, but on a salary perspective, you don't get paid. I would challenge that, that remark about, you know, with if somebody has chronic absenteeism and is under a salary and, and somebody doesn't, that there is a, a deficiency there. But anyway, we don't, I don't need to debate that um, from that perspective. Uh, like, again, uh, I think it's a balance between health care needs and our role as government in, in health care and in employment standards to, to have some achieve some kind of balance here. I don't know what it is. Um, we've done an employment standards review. From my perspective is um, I just, to, to do it, I just think there need, we need to still support the employer. And I agree with, with the stranger about that that's not her job. Uh, but again, 
who would need to do that duty for us in, in our system. Thank you. Thank you. The Honourable Premier. Uh, look, I appreciate you bringing this to the floor. I appreciate your comments. I think your comment, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you're looking at this strictly from a health care delivery perspective, uh, and I respect that 100%. I think the job of legislators here is to look, try to look as broadly as we can at these issues and uh, what impacts anything we do here might have on the overall productivity of our province and our economic success. That's a big part of this as well. Uh, so I guess my question would be to the um, promoter is how would we have accountability if we didn't have something like this? Uh, how, what accountability do we have within the system to... It's one thing to say trust. Uh, trust is great, but not everyone is most trustworthy. Like, let's be honest. Let's be totally honest. There are people who abuse EI. EI is set up for a great thing, and most people use it, but there are people who abuse it. What factors do you have into this bill to, uh, and how do we measure, quote, unquote, trust? To who, who's trustworthy? <laughs> well, <laughs> well I, I, think, I think, you know, you have, you have employees that you have working for you that you trust or you have employees working for you that you don't. And I might suggest, again, as, a, as, a, as an employer previously, you don't want to have people around you working, uh, either taking cash into your till or handling trust funds or, or doing any other number of uh, important uh, duties if you don't trust them. Like ultimately, you trust your employees or you don't, and if you don't trust them, they shouldn't be working for you. Maybe they sh maybe they're a better fit elsewhere. The Honourable Premier, you've obviously, as I have, and other legislators have talked to people from across PEI. We're in a significant labour challenge uh, in many areas. Um, how many employers have you run into that have dispensable employees that they could just dismiss because they're not good employees? <laughs> Well, I, in I, this climate, right? Yeah. Well, I, I guess, I guess I, 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 perhaps not a fan of the word dispensable employees. <laughs> uh, I, you know, any 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 good business needs good employees and good staff. You're not gonna you're not gonna have a, a good business. But I think that the point of this bill is uh, to alleviate the burdens. We've talked about that uh, this afternoon to some length, thanks uh, to the personal insight of, of the stranger. Um, it's not our job to, to, to regulate the relationships between private, uh, the, the relationship between a private employer and an employee in a private relationship. If they want to introduce measures extraneous to what the legislation does, as long as it's not contraven in contravention or contradictory to what, the, what rights are available and afforded to employees, there's nothing stopping em individual employers from putting in uh, alternative ways to monitor the behavior of their employees. The Honourable Premier. I believe the Minister of Workforce sort of alluded to the fact that we did go through a very comprehensive two-year uh, um, policy uh, development initiative that involved uh, islanders from across, you know, the province tip to tip, employers, employees, uh, all people who participate uh, in this uh, in this sphere. Um, the comprehensive report took a lot of time, and they have come up with some recommendations. So do you think it's good policy to just dismiss that two years of work that have gone in and the recommendations they brought forward? Do, do you think that mm. the amount of time you've put into this versus the amount of time that has gone into that contradictory uh, uh, piece of, uh, uh, of work that will become legislation, do you think mm. that should just be unilaterally dismissed because you started talking about this a few days ago? <laughs> well, I think we've started talking about this uh, a lot longer than a few days ago. I think uh, since that report was undertaken, you say it was a couple of years ago, Mr. Premier, I think what we've seen in that period of time is the uh, continued and further deterioration of a health care system that's in crisis. And I can't speak to what it was two or three years ago when that report was started, but I can say from what I'm hearing now, uh, it's worse. And I'm not pointing fingers, or I'm not going to sit here and, and, and make, make oh, well. as, as, to, as, as to why it's worse. I mean, we've had lots of debate and question period as to why perhaps it's yeah. not stronger than it is. Um, so I think sometimes uh, we, we have to be, to be nimble. 
And we've heard uh, from government that perhaps it's better to put money in some places because those places are more nimble uh, than other places. So I think in this particular instance, uh, we have the ability to act nimbly to do one small thing uh, that would, as we've heard from the stranger today, create a real benefit to the lives of patients and the frontline healthcare workers that does not require a wholesale uh, upheaval of our health care system, which it may well need, but that's not going to happen in one sitting of one session of one legislature. But this is the opportunity for this to happen in this sitting of this legislature. And uh, I guess going back to your other question, to your question, Mr. Premier, I believe that report did make some recommendation uh, with respect to how medical certificates should be amended, and I don't think that found its way into the amended act. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it, 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 seems to, it seems to me that if we're going to do what's good for the goose, we do what's good for the gander. And, 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 and so we, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not adhering to that act. Uh, so let's, let's look at an alternative that will have a real result, a real benefit here, as we've heard today. The Honorable Premier. Uh, I think I could speak with some authority that no good deed goes unpunished. Uh, there are unintended consequences to every good thing we try to do. Um, um, giving away money, for example, is proven to be, you would think on the surface, be a really good thing. But people have found a lot of, uh, there's been some unintended consequences of uh, those actions. Um, so I, can you not recognize the apprehension that some of us might have that uh, while I would, as the Minister of Health has suggested, like to do everything I can to alleviate the pressures uh, in any way we can on our frontline health care uh, uh, professionals. Um, how do we, how are we able to maintain some type of uh, oversight and, uh, and to ensure that we continue to have a productive workforce and that employers and employees can coexist, yeah. um, you know, in this. So it's, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, um, I feel what's being presented here and I have great admiration for how it's being presented, but I think we are seeing one side of this, which is a critical, important side. But there are other aspects and some unintended consequences that are going to stem from this, which is some of the points that we're raising. So would you recognize that, what I, the challenges that I bring forward? Well, I, 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 I recognize the position, Mr. Premier, you're, you're bringing forward, but, you know, and I'll let, I'll let the stranger on the floor also speak to this, but my immediate thought is if we're making comments about the importance of having uh, a productive workforce, um, what we're asking our employees to do uh, by going in sick and exposing themselves and others to sickness and greater sickness, I, mean, I think that speaks directly to the bottom line of our productive workforce, but I'll, I'll turn over I to the... I think that's an accurate representation of what I'm saying. Uh, accurate people, or inaccurate? I, I'd say it's not accurate, oh, so sorry. therefore it would be inaccurate. I, I'd say that uh, individuals make decisions for a variety of different reasons. I think. What I'm hearing you suggest is every business in PEI is making somebody go to work sick, which I don't think, first of all, is, is accurate, number one. Uh, and I think we are trying to find a balance, what the Minister of Health has said, that there's nothing wrong with a balanced approach to this. I would like to find a way to alleviate the pressures of our frontline services. So, but we also need to have some checks and balances in place through the Employment Standards Act to make sure employees and employers are accurately and adequately served. So, if it's not a sick leave certificate signed by a medical professional, what else can it be? What what other things can we uh, bring forward so that there is some kind of built-in accountability uh, to make sure that everybody is protected? No. If, if, Mr. Premier, you feel that that's necessary um, to achieve, which I'm not agreeing, um, I'm, I'm, I'm standing behind the bill. As I understand that. Yeah, I think this yeah. is where we're at a stalemate. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and, I, and, and I, I don't wish to, to misrepresent, and it wasn't my intention, and I 
certainly also didn't say that every employer is causing a trouble in the workplace. I'm simply saying that re having this requirement in place could undermine the, the, the concern that I've heard from yourself and also from the Minister of Health <laughs> that we want to have uh, a, a, a productive workforce, but we have to be mindful of how this uh, requirement as exercised by some employers in some circumstances will undermine that outcome. But I also know that my friend, my sure. friend here wanted to sure. add to yep. this conversation as well. I cannot underline again, you've spoken repeatedly of, of <coughs> verification and trust. If the patient is coming and telling me they're sick, I believe them. They're giving me the same information they would give their employer. I am not adding anything to that. All this adds is a barrier to the patient taking time off oh, for that individual. That. Yeah. There is nothing I am adding to that. It is purely being exercised as a barrier that, in essence, forces employees to come to work sick due to lack of access to health care or requires them to take health care resources that would not otherwise be needed but for that requirement from the employer. Ultimately, my job is not to deal with the health care or the, the human resources of private business and, and every multiple physician associations, such as the Canadian Medical Association, the Ontario Medical Association, Doctors NS, the Canadian Association of Emergency Physicians, as well as every single physician I have spoken to on this topic, is in favour of doing away as much as possible with sick notes for minor illness. We all view it as an inappropriate use of our time. It's not fair to our patients, and it is not in keeping with the care we need to provide. I appreciate, that. I appreciate that, but that's not what I was talking about. I was talking about there needs to be checks and balances in the. I can't just leave work for six months and say I'm sick. Oh. I someone would need to validate that at some point. I'm sure. I don't know who would do that uh, under this system that you're talking about. But I mean, at, at I mean, we need to have some accountability. You have to recognize whether you want to personally admit it or not that there are people out there who will take full abuse of this system particularly if they're being paid. So we have, we, it's not out of the realm of normalcy that we would ask the question, how would we police this and get people to make sure that people are going to work? I mean, I am not I, a police I understand, officer, Minister. I know, I'm not asking you to be a police officer. I want you to be removed from it. But we need to have, I'm talking about the other aspect of this, which is how do we have checks and balances in place? It's fully supported on this side that we would like to take the burden off of our frontline health care system. But we do need some accountability within our Employment Standards Act to make sure there's productivity and fairness and equality across the board. So all I'm asking is, what is the alternative to that? I, I, you should be removed from it. I understand that. What is the alternative to that? Well, I, I, <laughs> if we want to look at alternatives, I think we need to also first look at what is in place right now. And we've heard from the stranger on the floor that that piece of paper that the employer requires right now is not worth the amount that you would pay for that piece of paper okay. because there is no analysis done of the patient to determine bona fide sickness or not. So uh, we have a system in place that uh, creates, a, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what word to use, but it's, 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 it's so faulty because the employer, pursuant to the legislation, is asking for a medical certificate. A certificate, by definition, is actually is something that verifies something that you can rely on. The examination that results in that certificate being prepared is, is, is is not complete. It's not thorough. It's farce. Is okay. what it is because okay. it's because it's there. There's no there is no under under. There's no basis or foundation to that certificate being true that the employer relies on. So we're sending the employee and the employer and the frontline healthcare system in a circular system that 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 has no value whatsoever. I appreciate that, and I you've brought me back to the first question I asked that I still haven't gotten what I think would be an adequate answer. Removing this, now what? Yep. How do we have any policing of this? And how do we have any understanding who would do this, how they would do it, how are employees or employers protected? So when, without this, does an employer come in and say, I'm firing you because you're sick Thursday? How would we, what is the replacement of this? I want the physicians removed from it. Yeah. 
Right. What is the replacement? This is the un potential unintended consequences of trying to do something that seems like a really good thing, right. but what is the alternative? No, 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 Mr. Premier, the, the, the consequence of this bill is to remove sick days, sick notes, medical certificates from the very few sick days that are being av made available under the amendment to the Employment Standards Act. We're not talking, we're talking three paid after three years, and we're talking three unpaid after three months, I think it is. So beyond that, be, beyond that period of time, there is nothing stopping the employer from requiring the sick notes. So I just want to make sure we take the conversation. I know, but I, aren't, aren't you, you seem like you're talking out of both sides of your mouth on this. No, because no, I'm trying so to address sick your leave notes, they're going to be required that there are, our, our stranger is saying, we need to stop this because yep. this is they're, they're not worth the paper they're written on and they're right. not worth the time that's being wasted. Right. But you're saying we'll leave that in there as long as we can get this part out of it. I, I, I don't understand the, well, uh, the consequence. That, that, I don't that, understand that, what you're trying to, that, I understand what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. Uh, and I think in theory we want to support it, but I, I think it's, to me, it's rushed. I don't think it's as thorough as it should be. I think you've started talking about this in question period a week and a half ago, and now a bill has shown up in the dying days of the legislature. Well, That's well, not how good public policy should be made, in well, my in my opinion. I think that is a terrible. And I think the other part that I find troublesome with this is that the government of Prince Edward Island pays policymakers millions of dollars a year in each department to have input into what should be good government policy and what the unintended consequences could be, and none of them have been consulted in this, and that to me is problematic. If we want good legislation in here, we should sit down and come up with good legislation, not rush it for a few minutes like the honorable member from Charlottetown West Royalty did. I would like to find a way to work with you to find a solution to this. Mm -hmm. I don't think this is something we should do in four or five days and rush something through without knowing, as you initially have told me, what the unintended consequences might be. Yeah. If I could respond to that, Please. Mr. Premier, yes, which I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do, <laughs> and and I'm going to I'm going to say a couple of things on that. I'm going to take us back to the bill before us because it seems like much of the discussion in the House uh, today has uh, extrapolated out to I'm not sure. I think at one point you mentioned Mr. Premier being out of the office for six months. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we're, we're we're not we're not going there with this particular bill. We're talking three paid sick days and three unpaid sick days, which will only accumulate over a period of years. Can, and, I, can and I just interrupt there just for clarity? Certainly. So if a person qualifies for that and they're sick one day, they don't need a note to get their sick pay? Based on what we're proposing, no. Yeah. Okay. But you're saying they do un currently? Yes. No, which is not true, though, because you need a sick, the legislation says if Currently. you're sick three consecutive yes. days, so right. you're, Currently. to me, yeah. this is what I'm yeah. saying, yeah. It, it all sounds wonderful, but it's not thoroughly being uh, articulated to the, and I'm not either, and look, I want to, I think this is necessary, I don't think this is the way to do it. No. I think we need to sit down. Well, you should sit down with the people who are paid millions of dollars to do this. Well, uh, uh, it's uh, the uh, same as the tractor bill or the other bill. Is that it, it's 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 offensive, and it should be offensive to us as legislators that you wouldn't have the people who are paid every day. It would be like putting in. It would be like putting in a, a something for. Uh, nurses without consulting like you like the, this is what they do these are the professionals who work within the system and they've been working based on the last two years to develop the comprehensive policy challenge differences and new initiatives based on two years of, of, of well. debate from across the board employees employers thousands of hours have gone into it and they're sitting back saying I did all this work, and now the new member from Borden King Cora, who's very smart and articulate and is doing a good job defending his bill, brought something forward in five days to throw everything out the door that we've done. Well, <laughs> Mr. Mr. well it's true. I mean, I, I hate to say it, Mr. but it's Mr. True. Premier, if, if, if we're going to rely on all of the millions of dollars of employees uh, that, that have been, that are at the ready to do this, that 
panel that conducted the extensive review that you brought up or that the Minister of Health brought up uh, with respect to amendments to the Employment Standards Act, why are we not implementing what they suggested? They, they have agreed. taken hundreds of recommendations from all different sectors and brought them together to make serious new changes to the Employment Standards Act. That's the comprehensive undertaking that they have, have done. So, so 97 well, recommendations. Well. And I think it's, it's not accurate for you to suggest that they didn't do this. They have taken the information which I didn't they say compiled. They didn't do it. I didn't say they yeah, didn't well, do it. That's kind of what you said. That's kind of what you said. <laughs> I said the government didn't implement the recommendations, but it had the opportunity well, they've to implement the 97. Well, I, I, I believe I have a right to ask questions. No, I have no problem with This is a pretty significant bill that has been thrown no. upon us here. I, I want to fix, I want to remove it, but I, no. I need some you know, comfort to know what we replace it with or how, I, and we don't have any no. solid answers. I think so that's, so thank, uh, look, I thank the we'll move. uh, mover, I, I, I appreciate it. We, we would like to find a way to work with you uh, to uh, have a balanced approach to this. I don't think in this current form it's something that I'm going to be able to support at this time, but I would like to uh, uh, figure out how we can go about having a balanced uh, uh, approach toward this so we can remove the pressures on our frontline health care workers and have some accountability within our Employment Standards Act. So I appreciate call that. Question. Call the question. Uh, one second, I have one more on my list. Leader of the third party, did you still want the I want to say one thing. Based on what the Premier just said, about us paying millions of dollars to policymakers, why are we even in this room? Another thing I want to say, we can't create policy based on assuming people are going to take advantage of it. Um, how much does it cost a business if an employee comes in sick? And I think that businesses are competent enough to come up with an internal uh, mechanism for each their own business and I would also like to say this does not six months this is within the um, Employment Standards Act so we're talking about six days that's all I have to say um, I guess we call the vote, yeah, yeah, the vote. Minister of Health and Wellness just, just one final comment I think everyone would agree this is a national kind of issue right again it's not limited to, uh, to PEI my issue with the Patient Access to Care Act from Nova Scotia I am under that they did consultations with pharmacists, dentists, OTs, like the, the other people that are able to participate in this program. Again, that's a dispersal of work. Again, I don't know, it, yeah, if we don't, we don't bill for it, I don't know how we know how many we're doing, but I'll, I'll use a number. If, we're, if we do 10,000 a year and we have, now we have 10 providers, we've reduced it by to 10 percent. But again, that's my comment is that. Can we call the vote? Okay, so an act to amend an act to amend the Employment Standard Act. Shall it carry? Yes. Yes. I got both sides going here. All those in favor and yes, can you raise your hand? And those nays. And the bill does not carry. Your bill's defeated. Remember? Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the chair and that the chair report the bill not recommended. Shall it carry? Mr. Speaker, as chair of a committee of the whole house, having had under consideration a bill to be intitled an act to amend an act to amend the Employment Standard Act, 
I beg to leave to report that the committee has gone through the said bill and does not recommend. Same to the Legislative Assembly. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Shall it carry? A record division has been requested. Sergeant Arms, can you please uh, ring the bell? Government is ready for the vote. Thank you, Member. Uh, the opposition is ready to vote, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Third party is ready for the vote, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. All right, honourable members. Uh, all those uh, voting against the report of the committee, please stand. The member from Morden King Cora. The leader of the third party. The member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Honourable leader of the opposition. Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Member from O'Leary and Vernesse. All those voting in favor of the report of the committee, please stand. Minister of Education, Minister of Finance, Honorable Premier, Minister of Agriculture, Minister of Environment, Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, Member from Charlottetown, Winslow, Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture, Minister of Workforce Advanced Learning and Population, Minister of Social Development and Seniors, the Minister of Economic Development and Innovation and Trade, the Minister of Health and Wellness, the member from Rustico Emerald, the member from Surrey Elmira, member from Summerside Wilmot, the member from Tyne Valley Sherbrooke, member from Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, members. The report of the committee uh, is adopted. Uh, Deputy Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Honorable Premier that the first order of the day be now read. Shall it carry? Carry. Order number one, consideration of the estimates in committee. Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Honorable Premier that this House do now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole House to further consider the grant of supply of His Majesty. Shall it carry? Carry. I'll ask the member for Summerside Wilmot to chair Committee of the Whole. The House is now in Committee of the Whole House to consider the grants of supply to His Majesty. Did the Minister want to take a stranger to the floor? Yes, I do. Shall it carry? Carry. If the stranger could state her name and title for her please. Yes, uh, my name is Trish Cameron McDonald, Director of Finance with Social Development and Seniors. Trish. We are <coughs> Committee, we are on page 154. We have something to table. You so had something to table, did you, Minister? Take backs from yesterday and the questions from the written questions as well. 
that were discussed yesterday. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I have one more on it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, my dear. Uh, we ended off yesterday, we read the section, strategic strategy, policy, and seniors. We debated it. I have one more on my list. It was the leader of the third party. Uh, sorry, Chair, are we still on uh, Page strategy? 154, strategy, policy, and seniors. Um, I, I think, I don't think I have any more questions. Shella Carey. Carey, the budget. Carry the budget. Carry the budget. Social programs. Total social programs, 134,400, sorry, 134 million, 431,900. I have on my list from yesterday that Borden Kinkora had a question that was referred to this subject. Can't recall it, Mr. Chair, I'll pass. No, is either Oh, no, that was, they were all under child care. I have no idea what it was. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I'm going to pass on my question. Okay. Oh. Leader of the opposition. Marshall, so has the department invested any further on studying a basic income, income, income guarantee in the province? Oh. Is there anything in anything discussions with your federal uh, counterparts that is reflected in this current budget? Uh, we did answer that yesterday as well. Um, we have a general consulting uh, budget that if we get to a point where we're able to do, to pull together more of a working group, we can um, use that general consulting budget for that. Leader of the opposition. Thank you very much, Chair. And I'm asking it again just in, in relation to this particular section that we're on right now. In this section? Yeah. Um, no, <coughs> sorry. The general consulting budget that would be available if we get to a point that we can pull together a working group, is in the strategy policy and seniors okay. division. Okay. Yes. Thank you for clarity. Yeah. Leader of the opposition. So, um, social programs. So, child po uh, poverty in this province hit 15 percent, I think, in 2021. And since that time, um, given the cost of, of living, we can safely assume that that, nigher, that, that number should be higher today. Um, so, what investments are within this particular section? that are going to reduce that statistic? Um, so first I'll speak to new investments. We do have the children's benefit, $1.1 million added uh, to begin in January of 2025. And we'll require another $3.3 .3 million added to the next budget year to annualize it. Leader of the opposition. Um, so with that, what measurements um, are your programs uh, utilizing in these investments to ensure that the number comes down, that the number comes down for, uh, comes down from 15%, let's say, in 2021? What um, measurements are these programs that are within this particular section um, utilizing any investment will ensure that these numbers come down? Yes, sir. I'm hearing you, I'm just trying to think of how I respond mm -hmm. to it and that, yep. as to how specifically it res relates to the, the budget. Y yes. I can talk about yep. the funding that we have in budget to mm -hmm. help with ch mm -hmm. children's poverty, perhaps I, but, but I, I think you're I'm talking something. about this particular section, how social programming will help yeah. reduce that number. What measurements are in place okay. to help reduce So that? the children's mm -hmm. benefits that I spoke mm -hmm. of, the 1.1 million, which will have to be increased to 4.4 million to annualize next year, is a payout to parents uh, depend and mm -hmm. dependent on the number of children in the family. We also have the uh, social assistance budget, which requires uh, funding for families. Sorry, I'm kind of struggling a little bit because the mandate of our department is to support and provide funding to the island's mm -hmm. most um, needy. Um, so really, I could, I see it as um, every dollar we have in our budget is supporting um, um, our clients. Um, so I could, I could speak to almost every budget line. Mm -hmm. Sorry. 
Leader of the opposition, last one in this set. Okay, I, I'm not sure what you mean by you could speak to each budget line. Each section you mean, or each budget line in this particular section? Um, most directly this, se this section. Okay, yeah. um, I'm going to come back on that. Okay. okay. Larry Inverness. Uh, thanks, uh, Minister. Uh, on the social programs now, your Minister? department has cut quite a bit of money. You've cut about 3 to $4 million out of your budget for, over what you forecast to spend last year. Uh, so on administration, 70100 What what is that money for, and uh, why would you be cutting administration? Is there less people in social assistance? Because it was 109000 so, spent last year. So the budget last year was 70100 But you spent hundred nine. So our forecast spend was above and beyond the budget. The budget stayed the same. However, we haven't increased it to meet the forecast. Yeah. Larry and Verness. Mm -hmm. You spent 109,000. So why? What, what was the reason why you spent 109,000? Mm -hmm. Then uh, over last, uh, what was budgeted? It's the same everywhere on the line here. We'll go through them one at a time. We've lots of time. So in this line, we had a lot of staff turnover, and staff turnover can trigger new space requirements, new computer equipment, things like that. So we're seeing. This kind of the equipment and the administration line is being driven by staff turnover, new equipment, new space needs, Spent. needing two desks where there used to be one, things like that. Olary and Verness. So you're projecting less staff then for the coming? No, we have an incredible increase in the number of clients in all of our programs. So we've also needed to react to that with staff. Olary and Verness. So you're saying you need more staff? There's been a lot of turnover. And staff. Olary and Verness. So do you need more staff or less staff? Well, we have added 4.5 FTE in this division. More staff, okay. Yeah. Olary and Verness, last one of this set. Not Great, thank, this. thank you, Chair. Uh, so you've got more staff, but you've got less administration. So that doesn't add up to me, the fact that you budgeted 70000 and uh, and uh, you spent 109000 but you're going to go back to 70000 but you've got more staff. So that... I mean, I know we get down to salaries, that will be reflective in that, but in, from an administration perspective, one would assume that if you have more, more staff, you need more administration, uh, whether it's pencils, uh, notepads, the list goes on. Mm -hmm. So is that a prudent use of the decision making where you're going to spend less on vulnerable people, basically, is that's who benefits from the, the administration that you do uh, to uh, go down to 70000 Take all day. <laughs> Can you phrase the question? Sorry. Oh, okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair. Hilarious so, minutes. so you you've answered the question that you have more uh, planning for more staff. There's been a lot of turnover, but you're planning for more staff. Mm -hmm. So, in the situation last year in administration, that's where we're at at the moment. It's administration. Mm -hmm. uh, you did spend 109,000, but you said there's going to be more staff coming uh, for the coming year, which you do indicate in salaries when we get to mm -hmm. that but you're going to have less money for administration. So I'm trying to figure out why is that. Mm -hmm. So the 109000 is a spend compared to the old year budget. Mm -hmm. So in that year, we had an overspend related to additional staff and staff turnover and space requirements. Larry and Verness? Well, to clarify that, so once again, I'm going back to saying uh, you had less staff spend last year so you're saying there's more staff, but you're not increasing your uh, administration, nor are you increasing your equipment. So that doesn't logically make sense to we me. Are so we are hopeful that the uh, improvement, space improvements, and the equipment purchases last year will be adequate for the coming year as well. Leader of the third party. Thank you. Okay. No, that's fine, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, so given the fact that Welcome back, Trish. Thank you. <laughs> Given the fact that we, we have an aging population and we have a growing population, mm -hmm. um, does the does department, department have any modeling to inform um, the future costs, of, the potential future costs of social programming? I know it's not directly related to the budget, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering how, if that informs the budget in any way. So, yes, it does not tie directly to budget, but what I can say <coughs> to help... Um, which I think will be helpful to your question, is when we 
um, discuss about the changes in rates and the money that we'll need to, to do those in the future years. We are looking and forecasting and we're comparing to the growth of the program what we think may, the growth that we may see in the future as well. Leader of the third party. And I'm speaking as a finance sorry. person, sorry, so, yeah. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Maybe I'll pose the question to the Minister and see if there's anything, I guess not, not to pose the question again, that was helpful. Is there anything that you could add to that? If it's finance related, I think it's already been answered. Yeah. Leader of third party. Thank you, Chair. But I'm wondering how you come up with this. I'm wondering if if you have any modeling that you use, because we do, I know we have the um, the population growth strategy now. So with that, is is there anything that your department does to, to look at the, f the future growth and aging population to determine how much you budget into your current budget and as you consider future budgets? Because, I mean, let's face it, this, this could potentially just keep going like this. Um, so how do, we, how do you plan for that in, in your budget? We do have uh, program analysts within the division that look at StatsCan data. They look at the Matri report. They look at trends occurring across Canada. And we take that into consideration in our process to build the budget. Okay. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. That's Thank you for that. Um, so I'm looking at the, the school age autism grants. Yes. And uh, so we've heard from a lot of parents who have said that um, they've had issues trying to get different supports for their child with autism. Have we, are we increasing eligibility for the grants? Uh, it's the, well, we haven't made a change to the program. We have for the first time in a while, because we speak about this every year, we're here, this program. Uh, we have overspent the budget this year. It's $1 million spend uh, for the first time in quite a while. So we are seeing, um, it's a $6,600 maximum benefit. So for the first time, we're seeing families um, use more of that 6,600 available to them. Uh, the last number of years, especially with COVID, it was a challenge to be able to find the tutors and, and the support services to be able to use more of that maximum, so. Leader of third party. Thank you, Chair. And is that a budget, given that it was overspent last year, is that a budget that is kind of flexible based on need? Is it something that, you know, because it's hard to predict, just like seniors food program, it's hard to predict how many people will get. So is that something that is flexible for families? We did make the decision to uh, fund all the requests last year. So that's about a 200,000 overage. Okay. Um, when we're, we're monitoring the budget at all times, so we're we're making those type of decisions. So, yeah. Okay. It was flexible last year. We overspent it by $200,000. We were happy to see the, the funding being used in prior years that hadn't yeah. been completely used. So, we felt it was a good news story. Yeah. Yeah. Leader of third party, last one you yep. set. Okay, thank you. I, I, I appreciate that because um, that is something if you don't know the need, but you've got the money there to make sure that people are able to access it is, you know, is important. Yeah. Um, so the new children's benefit, mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering, uh, so, sorry, I am wondering if there's any, um, and, and you don't, oh, that's not budget, I'm sorry. Um, okay, so I'm going to jump to caregiver grants and I'll come back if I can get back on the list. That would be great. Sure. Um, so the, the caregiver grants, um, still not quite rolled out. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if the children's benefit is, is that a little more easy to roll out? Is that something that because we have with the caregiver grant, we're still waiting for that mm -hmm. um, challenges and rolling it out. Is is that the same thing with the child's tax, children's benefit, or is that something that's a bit different to roll out? For clarity, the caregiver grant is a health and wellness health PEI initiative. Uh, the children's benefit, we're going to be um, using the CRA program. Uh, so we do anticipate that it should be easier. It's going to be based on taxes. We won't, uh, we are 
working with um, our counterparts in the Department of Finance to work through all the parameters. I believe that we have them, it's to a point where it, it's, I don't anticipate the challenge to put it in place because um, it's not something that we're administrating ourselves. We need to put together the program, determine the criteria. I believe them all, they're all in place, and then the payments will happen through the CRA program. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Cheryl Down West Royalty. Oh, thank you. Thanks for coming back, thank you, Minister. Just um, some questions on the um, the Seniors Independence Initiative, um, Minister. Why? Was the seniors food program in the east attached to that program? So that was a decision that was made before I came. This program, that program was running when I when I came on board. So um, the finance minister or finance um, CFO may be able to. Um, the pilot that program, uh, which we we stood up as quickly as we could, was attached to the seniors independence program. The close to three hundred thousand dollars that we spent this past fiscal year. Uh, we did an extra $50 to each individual client of the Seniors Independence Program, uh, but it was not attached in the same way as it was in the pilot. We sure. spent almost $110,000 through the community uh, meals, yeah. um, so that was not attached to the Seniors Independence Program. We also did $50,000 to Meals on Wheels. As part of that, almost $300,000 spent. That was not attached to the Seniors Independence Program. So the only piece in this last fiscal year of that close to $300,000 spent that, had, that was tied in in any way to the Seniors Independence Program was the $50 per side client. Cheryl Town West Royalty. I guess it just doesn't understand. Like, I guess my question was why, and then obviously, it, it was why was that done, and then who did the analysis? Because it was attached to that pilot program, was attached to the Seniors Independence Initiative. Did those staff have to analyze the program? So what I, what I can tell you, and, and from what I know from talking with, with staff, is that it was based on need. So uh, seniors who were um, part of the program, the Seniors Independence Program Initiative, um, were the seniors that they seen most in need. So that's why it, they targeted uh, that group of seniors. Charlton was royalty. That doesn't make sense because you made the criteria. Like, how would you know? How would you know there's other seniors out there outside of the Seniors Independence Initiative when it was attached to that? You shrunk your your pool of people that you could actually give support to, and that was my concern. Yeah. And I just don't understand why, again, Minister, that was attached to that. I'm just under trying to say. Well, I, I, again, I wasn't there, but I, I, it was a pilot program, and I think that's what they based it on, just the, the seniors who were most in need. Geraldine, Mr. Alti. So then, in, this, in that area, did they do the, and I read the document and the analysis of it, um, did the seniors independent staff, because that pilot program was attached to that other program, did they do the uh, analysis of that? Yes, they did. The staff in the Seniors Independence Initiative services? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. They did? Yeah, they did. They did. Yeah. Cheryl Down West Royalty, your last one in the set. Uh, okay. Um, I noticed um, there was, uh, it, it was actually great to see that the, there's more money being spent there. And I noticed that, that the access to that program has improved, especially in in my area, and I want to compliment the staff there working, they're, they're always there. So there's an overspend in that area, and I'm going to come back to this later on. But was there new programs attached to that overspend, or could you talk about that overspend, like no, new services attached to that? Uh, can you be a little more specific sure. which overspend? Are you speaking of the seniors' food overspend? No, sorry, okay. the, seniors, the seniors' independence, independence. initiative. It was, it was budgeted at yes. $2.2 million and you spent four. For just over four million dollars, so I want to know yep. if there was increased services, or I just maybe speak. It's to that. utilization. Utilization it's numbers. Yeah. Leader of the opposition. Thank you very much, Chair. So just going down the line on equipment, um, mm -hmm. eleven thousand five hundred was the budget estimate for last year. It's back on this year, but there was, you know, thirty something thousand mm -hmm. uh, in the forecast. What was that due to? Uh, very similar to the question um, on administration as well. It's the 
a number of staff. It's the computer needs. It's the um, turnover in staff. We are, we do have funding to hire another 4.5 permanent FTE this coming year. Um, so we're hoping that with the 33,000 extra spend last year, that those changes in the workspaces and the equipment that we that we brought on in the last fiscal year will be adequate. Leader of the opposition. Okay, thank you. I just needed to have uh, some clarification on that number. So basically, it's to the equipment is to put in place to take care of the new um, staff that would be coming into uh, this particular division. Is that correct? So it's not like it's yeah, it's like desks, rotation and staff. It's trying to keep up with the increase in the client base. We're seeing a lot of spaces where there might have been one staff. Now we need two, so you need a desk and you need <coughs> furniture and you need a computer for two people and. Leader of the opposition. Okay, you know, and that's what I was, uh, was I was asking about that part. So on material supplies and services, there was you know twenty five thousand dollars more in the forecast. What was that due to? Uh, it was driven by a license or a maintenance fee for the accessibility support system. So. Leader of the opposition. And how often does that licensing need renewal? Well, we have an annual fee. However, we must have had something a little extra done with it in this past year to drive the 25. Leader of the opposition, last one of this set. So you're not sure if that's going to be a recurring charge or not? We do pay annually the licensing fee. Mm -hmm. um, whether or not we had something outside the norm this last fiscal year to explain why it's 25,000, I would need to. I would need to take that back. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. you. O'Leary and Verness. Uh, you've got quite an increase, Minister, in professional services. Uh, you yes. know, from last year you spent sixty-one thousand. Now you're up to four hundred and fourteen thousand nine hundred. What what professional services were you requiring to go to that number of an increase in the budget? So, thank you. Very good question. Yes, it is quite an increase. Mm. Um, it's tied to the overspend in the accessibility supports line of nine point three million. Um, the accessibility support program has had a 60% growth since 2018 mm -hmm. and uh, about 70% of the assessments in that program are triggering complex uh, support needs. Mm -hmm. So the cost is through the roof. The $350,000 is um, for us to hire a consultant to help us review this program. Uh, we're at the final stages of determining mm -hmm. who that consultant will be. O'Leary and Burness. Why would you need a consultant? Uh, so you're, we're assuming you're at having a consultant to review those professionals that are determining whether people are eligible for the accessibility program. Is that they're determining their, el their disability is valid? I'm, I'm very sorry. Can you repeat that? <laughs> so I'm going back to, so you're hot, uh, as you sort of described, I want to be clear, clear of this. Mm -hmm. So you're hiring a consultant to review the professionals that are determining whether individuals who are applying for the accessibility supports are really disabled? Is that it? Or? No. Okay. We are hiring a consultant to help us look at the program itself, the things that we're funding, how we're funding it, how people become eligible, how they apply, um, and the components of the program. And we will need to do a budget adjustment. We wanted to do it at a time where we feel we are most informed around what the needs of the program are and how to shape that, um, the changes that should happen. Well, Larry and Verness. So, Minister, do you find that there are people that are applying for the accessibility supports that aren't out, that you don't think are eligible or they're not disabled enough? Or no, we're it? looking at how to improve the application Services. process. Well, Larry and Verness. So what's the problem with the application process as you see now? Or why do you see that there's a need for a consultant? It is one component of the whole review. Okay. And the whole review is becoming a necessity because of the, the spending challenges, the spending pressures, uh, which are driven from the growth of the program and it's driven from the um, complex support needs and the 
how clients are being assessed. Mm -hmm. Well, Larry and Vernes, last one of your set. Thanks. And, and Minister, as you recall, that in question period, I asked you some questions about a, a you know, a young adult that was uh, disabled and uh, the ability to get supports at the cost that you're allocating is quite an issue. So I'm, I'm kind of going back to the accessibility supports. You're actually cutting that from last year's spend. You're doing a review, which seems to me you're trying to control that a little bit better on uh, how much uh, uh, people would be eligible for. You're a little concerned about the budgetary side of that. Um, but I would argue that from what I see in, in my area, you're seeing a, quite an increase mm -hmm. in individuals coming out of the school system mm -hmm. that are, have some disability or some designated disability. I, I would argue you, you don't even have near enough money in this budget to, to, uh, to deal with that, unless you're talking some major cuts here that, uh, in decision making on who is eligible. We're not talking cuts. Not We're all. wanting to make yeah. That's what I'm hoping to increases <laughs> to the budget. And so we're wanting to do that after the information we learn from the consultant. Okay, so Leader put me of the on the list again there. Yes, you're back. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I'm wondering um, if you can explain, there was an overspend in accessibility supports. I don't think that was asked. I know we talked about social supports. Um, so th there was an overspend on accessibility supports last year, um, but then the budget for this year seems eight million dollars less than what was spent last year. Are Can you, you explain that? You're you're speaking to the accessibility supports. That's uh, thirty-six point four million last year compared to a spend of forty-five point seven. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So that's the the piece I was just discussing that we're we're at at the three hundred fifty thousand dollars. Um, to help to pay for the consultant that we want to review this program, knowing that we will need we need to make an adjustment to that budget. We wanted to make it when it was informed with the analysis from the consultant. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I know that currently there is a review happening with the accessibility supports mm -hmm. program. Um, so one of the things that we talked extensively about last time and that we talk extensively about every time we talk about accessibility supports, I'm wondering if there's any additional funding in here for um, any sort of counseling supports. And that is That's going to be a component idea. of the review as well. Leader of third party. Thank you, Chair. And and I know this isn't a budget question, but I, if I when we had our meeting, I was under the impression that the, this was this was a while ago, but under the impression that the review was starting immediately and then it was, so when do we think that will be So completed? the review, we went, sorry, I interrupted you. Okay. <laughs> I get so excited to answer. <laughs> um, the review has gone out to an RFP. Yeah. The RFP is closed. Uh, we've analyzed the RFP and we're waiting for that final approval of the, um, of the profession, the organization to do, or of the consultant. So we're at the very final stages. It's been, um, by the time you kind of issue the RFP, you leave it open to the public, you receive the bids, you analyze the bids, it takes time. But we are at the final stages at this point. Leader of third party. Thank you, Chair. So finalizing getting ready for the review, not final, like getting Selecting. close to the end of the review? Selecting the consultant. So the review, what we want them to do is pretty clear in the RFP. So we're selecting the, the successful proponent. Leader of third party. Thank you, Chair. And um, I guess, Minister, it's disappointing <clears throat> given the time-sensitive nature of trauma in kids. And we haven't even started the review yet that I thought was starting when, you, when we had our meeting. You made it sound like this was going to happen quickly. And it's been no, over a year. Anyway. Okay. Um, um, so can I respond to that? Because I've just been in place a year. We met in the summer. Mm -hmm. and, and, close and we, to a year. Yeah, no, not even, not even close to a year. We met, mm -hmm. like, I think it was August or September. Uh, the Minister of Health was in the meeting as well. And I said, we are planning a review. And that was about six months ago, and things are in order. This program is just five years old, so I think it's sort of that five-year review to say, you know, what's working, what's not, what's needed, what isn't, and um, that's what we're that's what we're get some. And that 350 is also a residential service review. They're they're doing two reviews at the same time for our residential services as well. 
So, yeah, they're doing both reviews. Larry, third party. Thank you, Chair. What are the ceilings for financial support under this program? I have that. Okay. Uh, there are 11 categories for support, so the ceiling's $4,000. Sorry, can you repeat that number? Yes, sorry. Uh, there are 11 categories, and the ceiling for that top category is $4,000. Well, your third party, I'll give you one more. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you can tell me what's being funded under specialized residential supports. Yes, uh, specialized residential supports is, just to be clear, are you wanting me to explain uh, the new budget of 5.6 million? Mm. Okay, uh, they are for 55 um, clients that are being supported in, in residential. Cheryl Town West Royalty. I'm where are those clients? <clears throat> They are in <laughs> numerous, I don't have a list of like, I don't, th I don't think I could actually say yeah. exactly where they no, are, sorry, but they're, they're yeah. NGOs who are supporting us yeah. in finding homes for clients with complex critical care needs and uh, there are 55 of them supported in that 5.6 million. Charlottetown, West Rocky. The reason I ask is a lot of them are, like some of them are, I do a lot of Beach Grove Road and I know a lot of people are get great supports staff amazing absolutely yes. and just wondering about capacity I guess you know um, are we at a capacity issues with with our services that we're providing in that on that line um, so it is a three million dollar increase so mm -hmm. uh, it is certainly a spending pressure so yes there are we have capacity capacity concerns for sure it is very much a similar client base to the accessibility support programs, oftentimes the same clients. So it is also part of, we really can't review the AAS program without including the residential, specialized residential group as well. Um, so yes, we are concerned with capacity. Charlton sure, Westerall. The only reason I ask <clears throat> from two standpoints, I guess I can't ask for capital, but it's something that I can I can ask when the capital budget is down and, and make note of that. But it's hard to get staff to as well. Mm -hmm. um, are we as are we okay with staffing levels in, in our facilities um, that house uh, fifty five clients under specialized residential supports? So currently it is our NGO partners who are supporting us. Uh, so it's not a capital expenditure for us. We would be providing an operating okay. grant to NGOs and um, very thankful to have been able to extend them an extra $3 million this coming year. Absolutely. Cheryl Dale, Um Just to, to go back to the RFP, um, the accessibility supports. Um, so you said the RFP was closed. Did that... $350,000 is a lot of money. How did you know that number before? Was it included in the RFP or did, is that what? No, we wouldn't include that in the no. RFP. No, uh, because the RFP is trying to get um, qualified applicants to yeah. present a bid. Um, we really didn't know. We will, the only thing we could do is make an estimate based on what we've seen, and we wanted a significant review. This is an incredibly important program, mm -hmm. and we need a significant review, and so we made an estimate based on our experience. Sure, I'll tell you how much you're your last one of your set. And I guess I could get the scope of that on the RFP. Absolutely, yeah. yep. So, and Public then, document. Yeah, so is that going to be like maybe, a, is it, a, we're looking at a two-year review? No, no eight to that, 12 months. Eight to 12 months. Yeah. Leader of the opposition. Thank you very much, Chair. Just, I need a little bit more elaboration or clarification on a couple of lines. So, mm -hmm. I'm going to go back to materials, uh, sorry, professional services. And it was asked by Larry and Vernas of that particular line item, and it was to do with $300,000 for the review, correct? $350,000 yep. for this review. And when the leader of the third party asked about accessibility supports line, 
um, and the increase uh, that was uh, in the forecast mm -hmm. was also due to the accessibility supports program. Can you just explain why that would be on two different light items and what? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yes. So when we hire a consultant, we pay them through our professional services line. And we're hiring a consultant to help us review the AAS program because of the incredible overspend and the importance of the program. So when we pay the consultant, it's out of, we're paying them. So in the grant line, we're paying the clients. Okay. Leader of the opposition. You, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm just, I'm lost on that line. Um, so there was an in, a considerable increase of $10 million mm -hmm. on that line, and that was in the forecast. Now we're back down to similar to what it was uh, for what was budgeted last year. Mm -hmm. So that $10 million went to help clients? That $10 million is spent on clients and okay. providing supports for them. Okay. Leader of the opposition. Thank you, Chair. So if $10 million was spent um, in this past year, on clients because there was a need, then why wouldn't that reflect in the in the budget estimate for 24-25? Mm -hmm. We want to make an informed adjustment to the budget mm -hmm. um, after reviewing the program. So and so we're. I want to also add the AAS program is a legislative program, mm -hmm. and that means the um, amounts that we pay. And the eligibility criteria are defined either in an act or a regulation or a combination of both. So irregardless of the budget, if people qualify, they will be paid and it's an amount legislated in an act or a regulation. When we make this significant budget adjustment, we want to make it informed. We want to have the consultant work um, to help us make that informed budget change. Leader of the opposition. Thanks, Chair. So the $37,387 and $600, sorry, 387600 that's uh, in the 24-25 budget estimate, mm -hmm. that is going to change, certainly, uh, absolutely. absolutely. But where is that money going to come to to help those clients? Where is that money coming from? In the same way it did in the last year. Which was, yeah. Um, yep, through the mm -hmm. Financial Administration Act has requirements um, around overspends, so we will be in line with what the Financial Administration Act requires. Leader of the opposition, last one you said. Just for clarity, I, I'm just, I'm, I, and I'm not, I just I don't understand where that would, would be special warrants or how does that money get into yeah. this budget? So because it's so considerable, it will likely have to be in some component a special warrant. Um, we will know more as we forecast through the year and how the spend progresses. Um, and that's how it was, how we were overspent this last year as well. And we follow very closely the requirements and the outline provided in the Financial Administration Act. Okay. Yeah. O'Leary and Burness. See, this is where I, I'm sort of saying in this whole budget process, you're into a special warrant before you even start here again. And this is what the Auditor General in the recommendations that said that you have to reduce your special warrants. So I'm trying to argue that you, you've, you've basically put a low number in, that, in the budget area knowing that the, like there's not going to be less people, unless you assume that there's a number of people going to pass away or, or move out of the province, that you're, and I, I just don't see that. I, I just look at... You know, when I, I look at those that are in the school system that are going to be entering into adulthood in the, in the next few years, it, the number is going to be significant. And you just have to go talk to some of your non-governmental organizations, mm -hmm. and that's what they're telling us, that the numbers are, are overwhelming becoming them. So I have a significant problem, the fact that you're cutting, basically cutting the budget of what you spent last year, knowing full well at the start of this whole budget debate that you're not, you're going to be into a special warrant, which is contrary to what the Auditor General recommended, and, uh, and yet you've increased the budget for professional services to de determine whether people are uh, getting the right amount of money to try to cut that, you, you know, knowing full well you're already mandated through legislation and regulations to provide those services to people once they're deemed uh, disabled. 
So how do you explain why that number is so low in comparison? How did you come up with the number of 37,387,600? I'm just trying to think of how I answer that any differently than I already have. Sorry. No, you're doing Very good. respectfully. Yeah, I'm you're just trying to say, how do I answer it any Maybe could you repeat the question and I'll sure. see if I can add Larry something Inverness. that's helpful. So I'm starting off again with saying that the accessibility supports under this mm -hmm. budget line, you're proposing to look for spending $37,387,600. We've already ascertained that the uh, numbers of people entering the system are going to probably be higher than they have been. You, you're, you're not informing to say that there's, uh, you expect a number of people to move away or pass away to come out of the system. You've allocated money of last year of 45,772,000. Logic, logic would say that that 37,387,600 is a low number. It, it's not realistic. And you, you expressed the answer that the, the reasoning you were, uh, you know, you, the only way you're legislated, you have to come up with the money, and the only way you can do that is a special warrant through the Financial Administration Act, mm -hmm. which we. I totally understand. My, my issue is, is that you're putting the low number. You're, you're going to be into a special warrant before you even start. So from a budgetary perspective, you're supposed to provide the legislature of uh, this province with accurate numbers that are going to generally reflect the, the uh, spend that you're having. That's what you're asking us to review. The Minister of Finance, I'm quite confident, is, would be frown rather negatively upon a special warrant a couple of months into a, <laughs> the system here. and. Uh, I, I just find that a number. So you, I've asked you to explain how that number was ascertained. Like I say, you estimated way, you pretty estimated $9 million less last time, and we've already seen $45 million. To me, that number should, I would have said if that was $45,700,000, I would say that makes sense, Minister. I would be totally understanding of that. But you've, you're proposing a cut that's not realistic, I guess is what I'm trying to say, and you've got you're going to be into a special warrant, and which, which, like I said before, we are frowning upon here in this legislature. <laughs> okay. So, well, there even is. So I still haven't got. How did 37 million be the number that you picked? Somebody must have picked this number, not out of thin air, I'm assuming. <laughs> so we have. Um, sorry, it's going to go back through. We have delayed the adjustment to the budget until we have the results of the review because we expect to have them, um, we, expect they, like, we expect them to be quite informative. So we've delayed them, adju the adjustment until then. Um, we will follow the Financial Administration Act as required. And yes, we, cert we don't expect to be spending 37.7. We're wanting to have an informed adjustment to the budget in the next year. Well, Larry Inverness. So what are you expecting to spend in that budget line in the coming year? So you're saying you don't expect that number to be accurate. Is that number going to be much higher or you just you expect it to be much lower? It will certainly be <coughs> higher than the 37.4. <laughs> How much higher is going to be informed by the review? Well, Larry Inverness. So, so then you would, but here's my point. So you're anticipating as the financial administrator of this department, it's going to be higher, but you put a number in that's lower than you anticipate. Isn't the whole budgetary process about you trying to give an accurate reflection of what your estimate would be, or the minister's estimate, what it would be in that budget line? Yes, but we also want to make informed, structure the, the budget in an informed way. Well, Larry Inverness. Okay, no, I, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of end that debate for a little while here in this anyway. But, um, you know, like I, I'd mentioned to the minister in, in question period, uh, issues, issues around accessibility supports and providing that level of service is now becoming increasingly difficult for people to find those services now at the costs that they're allocated, I guess, would be a, probably a fair assessment. Um, you know, Minister, I, I men mentioned the issue about, you know, government made decisions to provide wage parity to support workers in community care facilities. Uh, it's providing tuition 
for a number of different uh, programs for healthcare workers, uh, childcare workers. What what are you going to do here on this issue that we're dealing with with human services uh, professionals? And uh, if this budget number isn't really reflective, you're doing a review. Uh, it would sound to me that there's, you know, there, there's, it's even going to be harder to come up with more dollars to find supports for training or wage increases that are going to have to be probably dealt with. I, I mean, if I look at that particular family, that I'm, they still really didn't get a resolution. They, they did work significantly with the uh, non-governmental organization that provides those services. In the end, they didn't necessarily always uh, uh, take some of the requests or, or options that were provided to them, but they're now looking at trying to get through this themselves as a family. And this is going to cause great duress. And my fear, Minister, is going to be that this family will get maybe halfway through the process and uh, crisis will occur. Uh, what's your plans from a budgetary perspective on how you're going to handle these issues moving forward? Because I think they're going to be significant. Well, I'm not talking about any individual. No, I didn't or, say a name. Know, I'm, not, I'm not going to do that. But what I do know is that the, the department um, is... is um, does a wonderful job working with the clients, and um, and uh, if there's a crisis, they're in contact. I do know this. I do know this, and and I also, you know, without getting into your situation, um, so um, I I can't I can't applaud the department staff enough for the work the hard work that they do, and um, we're doing we're doing the review to come up with the, the best possible outcome so that the, 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 the clients are looked after to the best of the ability of, of, the, of the department. So, so um, I think that, um, as the CFO said, you know, we want, we want the best um, outcome to, uh, to come into play after we do the review. And, and I, I really don't know what else to say to that because I, I count on, on uh, the department and our CFO here to know that she realizes what she's doing. Well, Larry and Vernesse, last one of your set. Uh, Minister, I appreciate your compassion on the issue. I, I, I really do, and, and I really appreciate when you came up to my district and toured uh, our uh, uh, social development seniors' offices in O'Leary. I, I appreciate all that, too. And I know you, you've made you know, or at least your department has made efforts in dealing with uh, my particular uh, constituents' problems. But I see this as it's the tip of the iceberg. And uh, I would say that your department and, and yourself are going to have to uh, really try to come up with a solution more than just I'm caring. <laughs> because uh, once again, I go back to seeing the, the stress that these families are under. Um, and the amount of individuals that are coming uh, from the school system into the adult area and that they've now and and uh, these these families are really under a lot of duress and then you know in, in mm -hmm. my constituents case the duress you know did cause marital issues and uh, now everybody's in a, in a in almost crisis mode yeah. and when you get a situation where you know one family member has to go for surgery and you have nobody there to support that and, and it's not that the department didn't try I, yeah, to I totally yeah, get I that make that clear I, yeah. I, I totally get okay. that but but in the end a resolution hasn't really occurred the family was wound up at this point on its own and uh, I, I just think from a budgetary, or at least do you feel from a budgetary perspective that there's going to be, I don't want to call it a tsunami, but you're going to see quite an increase in uh, people going to require accessibility supports and specialized residential supports uh, moving forward. And all I'm seeing in, under these, a lot of these categories is that there's cuts or it's really cost of living increases. That's about it. it. And I just have one thing, like I, in, in social programs, it was an increase of 14.9 uh, $14 million in social programs. So, so in, in accessibility and social mm -hmm. services and, you know, so, so I know, I know there, there's cuts, but there's been significant increases in mm -hmm. this budget. So. Uh, Chair, is that, or is that my last? I'll come back to you on the <laughs> Fine, Chair. Put me on the Later, third party. Thank you, Chair. And I just want to, I'm just, I, this was just put on our desk. I'm just, yeah. I, it may not be in the right section, but I'm just wondering where this 
came from. Was it in response to a question yesterday? Yes, yesterday we were asked about, um, I believe it was the leader of the opposition. It was a consulting money that was spent. Um, so there was about $6,000 that was spent for that. That, uh, I'm sorry, it was from Prime Communications. It was on the um, aging. Positive, sorry. Yes, thank you. Positive. Leader of the third party. Positive images of aging concept development and research summary final report. Yes. Um, this was in another section? Yes. Okay. Because I have a lot of questions on this. I have a lot of questions on this. I, I, I do, I, I'd love to know where, why, where this came from and, and why we needed it. Yes. Um, in the handouts, in your booklet of handouts, in the consulting line for strategy policy and seniors, there was just a little over $6,000 spent that the leader of the opposition asked about yesterday and asked specifically to see the outcome of what that spend was, which is that document. Okay. Yeah. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Since it's not in this section, I will move on. Um, so uh, I was asking about social assistance whenever I, I finished off. So, um, and. Uh, I hadn't asked the question, someone else did, about the increase. So I'm wondering with this increase, and if this has already been asked, just let me know, I didn't hear it. Um, what kind of increase to benefits Islanders can expect with this increase to um, social assistance? Mm -hmm. I know there were, you had said there were some new positions hired, maybe that wasn't in that section. Are you looking at the, um, trying to think of which line you're at? Uh, it's the, Social it, assistance benefits. Okay, so it was 53.7 million in the last budget. It's now 56 million in the the new budget. Um, that 2.3 million dollar increase funded the uh, new social assistance rates that began January, okay. and also have um, some money in there for new rates that will begin next fall or next January. Yeah. Leader of third party. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so moving on to the Seniors and Dependents mm -hmm. Initiative. Uh, so there was there was a $4 million spend mm -hmm. last year, and then this year there's only $3 million budgeted, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering about that decrease. Um, so in the prior year budget, it was the $2,296,000, and the new budget has been increased to $2,976,000, which is not as much as what the spend was, the $4,046,700. Um, so that increase from the 2.3 to the 2.9, almost $3 million, was to cover a $100 increase to the benefit amount, the maximum benefit amount, and also um, to start the catch-up that we'll need to do in the base budget because we do have an overspend. Leader of third party. Thank you, Chair. And so I, I, I may, there might have been something I was supposed to read between the lines there, but I didn't. I'm wondering, do we think that that will be enough, or do we foresee going over that again? Like those, the $100 top-ups, were those a one-time Oh, sorry. So um, let me just find an, the number for you here. No. So the... Um, maximum benefit for a senior on seniors and dependents is 1700 and throughout this year we will be increasing it to 1800 so we don't drop them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Leader of third party, last one in your set. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, do, I'm wondering, I don't know if you have the numbers in front of you, I'm wondering how many um, seniors access the seniors and dependents mm -hmm. program. I do have it. Yep. <clears throat> Sorry, I have to put these on. <coughs> um, 2,486 was the average um, in 2324. Okay. Average okay. monthly client base. Thank you. Charlottetown West Royalty. I'm just going to call the hour. Extended hour? No. Hours not extended. Extended? No. 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 One no is in. Okay. 
Okay. Sorry. <laughs> we'll do this again tomorrow. <laughs> oh. Mr. Uh, chair, I move that the speaker take the chair and that the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Shall I carry? Carry. Where am I at? Am I in the back of this? Mr. Chair, Mr. Speaker, as Chair of a Committee of the Whole House, having under consideration the grant of supply to His Majesty, I beg leave to report that the Committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I move the report of, committee, of the Committee be adopted. Shaw Carey. Carey. The uh, Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move, seconded by the member from Rustico Emerald, that this House now adjourn until Thursday, April 18th at 10 a.m. Shall I carry? Sorry. 1 p.m. <laughs> See you in the morning. Shall 1 p.m. carry? Carry. Thanks, Tyler.